Hello and welcome back to the Electronic Intifada's live stream for Wednesday, March 27th. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Nora Barrows-Friedman with my colleagues Ali Abunima, Asa Wynn stanley John Elmer, and Tamara Nassar. It's day 173 of Israel's genocide in Gaza. We have another packed show for you today, including a full discussion with our friend Abdel Jawad Omar, a lecturer based in the West Bank, and a full roundup of videos from the Palestinian armed resistance with John Elmer. Dr. Ipeng Gi was supposed to join us, but uh, unfortunately he had a travel delay at the last minute. We'll try to have him on next week. Here's some of the news that we've been covering at the Electronic Intifada. Israeli airstrikes hit areas across the Gaza Strip yesterday and today, including repeated attacks on Rafah in the southernmost area of Gaza, as well as Jubalia refugee camp in the north. Al Jazeera reported yesterday that the Israeli military bombed a house in Rafah, killing at least 15 people and injuring more. The building was housing displaced Palestinians, and among the dead are at least four children. Dozens more have been killed in a series of airstrikes on Rafah over the last 24 hours. For more than a week, Israeli forces have besieged and attacked Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, as well as the surrounding residential neighborhoods in open battle with Palestinian resistance fighters who have continued to defend the area. Over the past few days, testimonies have emerged from people under siege at Al-Shifa Hospital who have described atrocities committed by the Israeli military. Along with arbitrary arrests, torture, and the burning of people's homes in the area, the Geneva-based Euromed Human, Human Rights Monitor reports that Israeli soldiers have been strip-searching civilians and using them as human shields. The Human Rights Group stated on Sunday that, quote, Testimonies reveal that Israeli forces used civilians, including patients and displaced individuals inside the Shifa medical complex as human shields, exploiting them to protect their military operations within the hospital, form barriers behind their forces and military vehicles, or send them under threat to residential homes and buildings surrounding the medical complex to evacuate them before the Israeli army raids, arrests some of the residents, and subsequently destroys many of these buildings. One Palestinian identified as KF, who was sheltering in the Shifa medical complex, stated that Israeli forces ordered him and three other young men to enter several rooms inside the Shifa medical complex after cameras were attached to their heads. They were then forced to move by remote orders issued by the Israeli army towards specific locations for inspection. He added that he was forced by the Israeli army to move through orders in the general surgery building inside the Shifa medical complex for several continuous hours before being forcibly evacuated with his wife and daughter while knowing nothing about the fate of the other young men used by the Israeli army as human shields in the same incident. Euromed Human Rights Monitor reported on Friday that Israeli forces have been systematically removing Palestinians from their homes around Al-Shifa and burning the buildings. A resident of the neighborhood told the human rights group that, quote, we saw death before our eyes. They stormed the residential building where my family resides, and suddenly we found 50 armed soldiers in the middle of the living room. They ordered the men to strip naked and the women to follow them. They took us to the first floor where they placed the men in a room next to us before taking them to Al Shifa Hospital. As for us women, they ordered us to go down and head toward the southern areas of the strip. Another witness reported to Euromed that, quote, the Israeli army raided her house, separated women from men, and, and instructed women to go alone with their children to the southern areas of the strip before setting the house on fire and burning it completely. The Director General of the World Health Organization stated over the weekend that the conditions at Al Shifa are, quote, utterly inhumane. A doctor at Al Shifa relayed to him the following information 50 health workers, most of them junior or volunteers, and 143 patients have all been kept in one building since the second day of the raid, with extremely limited food, water, and only one non functional toilet. Patients are in critical condition, many lying on the floor. Three patients are in need of intensive care. Two patients are on life support, 
Uh, two patients on life support died to, due to a lack of electricity. Patients have no companions or caretakers, no basic medical supplies, no dressing, no medicines available, and health workers have requested urgent patient referrals. The Palestinian Health Ministry in Gaza stated on Tuesday that Israel has, quote, tightened its siege of health personnel, patients, and wounded in the Shifa medical complex, detaining them inside the human resources development building in the complex that is not prepared for health care and preventing them from leaving it. Reports have emerged that the Israeli army is now using Al Shifa hospital as a military base. Along with the attacks on Al Shifa, Israeli forces have resumed their attacks on the Nasser medical complex in Khan Yunus over the last several days, arresting and detaining medical staff and displaced persons. Also in Khan Yunus, the Palestine Red Crescent Society announced on Tuesday that its headquarters, the Al Amal Hospital, has been entirely taken out of service following an Israeli siege that lasted more than 40 days. The Red Crescent stated that Israeli occupation forces forced hospital staff and wounded patients to evacuate the hospital and then closed its entrances with dirt mounds. In a statement, the Palestine Red Crescent Society said it, quote, expresses its disappointment that Al Amal Hospital was taken out of service after the international community failed to provide the necessary protection for its staff, patients, and displaced persons. The hospital was besieged for more than 40 days and shelled several times before the occupation forces resumed its siege again and forced everyone in it to leave, leaving the hospital destroyed. The same fate befell the Red Crescent's Al-Quds Hospital in Gaza City, which was taken out of service several months ago. The Palestine Red Crescent added, quote, this direct targeting of the Red Crescent's Al-Amal Hospital and its crews is added to the Israeli occupation's record of continuous violations against medical personnel in general and against Red Crescent medical personnel in particular since the start of the aggression against the Strip on October 7th of last year. The number of Palestine Red Crescent martyrs that were targeted by the occupation forces while performing their humanitarian duties has reached 15, while the occupation continues to unlawfully arrest 13 Red Crescent crews whose whereabouts and fates remain unknown. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs stated on Monday that Red Crescent staff and wounded patients were transferred to Rafah after being trapped in, an, in ambulances outside Al Amal Hospital for about 20 hours. The Israeli military had forced them to evacuate the hospital on Sunday, and when two people exited the ambulances to clear the rubble on the road to the military checkpoint, they were fired on by the Israeli army. Upon returning to Al Amal Hospital, they found the door closed and were trapped inside the ambulances. The Israeli military said it had killed 20 armed Palestinians in or around Al Amal Hospital. Israeli forces are continuing to massacre Palestinians awaiting aid deliveries, especially in northern Gaza, as part of Israel's engineered starvation policy. On Tuesday, Palestinians drowned after an airdrop of humanitarian aid landed in the frigid waters off the Gaza coast in the north and people swam out to retrieve the parcels. The U.S. White House said it will continue supplying humanitarian relief from the air into the Gaza Strip despite Palestinians dying by drowning, stampedes, and falling aid boxes while trying to reach the aid, Al Jazeera reported. A spokesperson for the National Security Council told the network that, quote, airdrops are one of the many ways that we are helping to provide desperately needed aid to Palestinians in Gaza, and we will continue to do so, as thousands of aid trucks remain uh, stuck at the border crossings. On Tuesday, Palestinians awaiting aid at the Kuwaiti roundabout in Gaza City documented the scene where Israeli snipers shot at people awaiting aid. This comes just days after the Israeli military announced it was no longer approving any aid convoys to the northern Gaza Strip that are administered by UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees. The UN reports that between March 16th and 22nd, nine out of 17 humanitarian aid missions to northern Gaza were facilitated by the Israeli authorities, five were denied, and three were postponed or withdrawn.
During the same period, 33 out of 42 humanitarian aid missions to southern areas that require coordination were facilitated by the Israeli authorities, four were denied, and five were postponed or withdrawn. Philippe Lazzarini, UNRWA's commissioner general, admonished the Israeli government, saying it was, quote, outrageous and makes it intentional to obstruct life-saving assistance during a man-made famine. He called on the restrictions to be lifted, adding that, quote, UNRWA is the largest organization within the highest reach to displaced communities in Gaza. By preventing UNRWA to fulfill its mandate in Gaza, the clock will tick faster towards famine and many more will die of hunger, dehydration, and lack of shelter. This cannot happen. It would only stain our collective humanity, Lazzarini said. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur for Palestine, presented a report to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, stating that there are, quote, reasonable grounds to believe that Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Albanese's 25-page report titled Anatomy of a Genocide documents in searing detail how Israel has committed acts of genocide over the last six months of attacks on Gaza. Albanese said, quote, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent, causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. Furthermore, Albanese said that, quote, the genocide in Gaza is the most extreme stage of a long-standing settler colonial process of erasure of the native Palestinians. Albanese's recommendations include that UN member states immediately implement an arms embargo on Israel, as it appears to have failed to comply with the binding measures ordered by the International Court of Justice in January, as well as other economic and political measures necessary to ensure an immediate and lasting ceasefire and to restore respect for international law, including sanctions, and to support South Africa's intervention at the International Court of Justice. months of unrelenting Israeli assault on occupied Gaza. It is my solemn duty to report on the worst of what humanity is capable of and to present my finding, the anatomy of a genocide. One of my key findings is that Israel's executive and military leadership and soldiers have intentionally distorted rules of international humanitarian law distinction, proportionality, and precaution in an attempt to legitimize genocidal violence against the Palestinian people by deliberately stretching the definitions of human shield, evacuation orders, warnings, safe zones, collateral damage, and medical protection, Israel has used their protective function as humanitarian camouflage with the effect of concealing patterns of conduct from which the only inference can reasonably be drawn is a state policy of genocidal violence against the Palestinians. In light of this, I find that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the crime of genocide against Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. That was Francesca Albanese in Geneva yesterday. Albanese's pres presentation at the UN Human Rights Council came a day after the UN Security Council voted to adopt a Gaza ceasefire demand. Maureen Claire Murphy reported that, quote, nearly all 15 member states voted in favor of the resolution, with the exception of the U.S., which abstained but did not veto the text as it was quashed, as it quashed three previous draft resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Maureen adds that, quote, the adopted resolution demands an immediate ceasefire during Ramadan, which is halfway over, leading to a lasting sustainable ceasefire. Russia sought to change the resolution's language of a lasting ceasefire to a permanent ceasefire, but did not gain enough support.
The adopted resolution also calls for the, quote, immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and demands that, quote, parties comply with their obligations under international law in relation to all persons they detain. The brief text also demands the lifting of all barriers to the provision of humanitarian assistance at scale in line with international humanitarian law and previous resolutions adopted by the Security Council. The practical implications of the Security Council resolution for Palestinians enduring what the UN's principal judicial organ has ruled to be a plausible genocide remain to be seen, given that the U.S. continues to arm and greenlight Israel's military operations, Maureen writes. For more on the UN Security Council's resolution, read Maureen Claire Murphy's latest report, UN Security Council Adopts Demand for Ramadan Ceasefire in Gaza, on electronicintifada.net. Hamas stated on Monday that it welcomed the UN Security Council's ceasefire call, adding that, quote, we stress the necessity of reaching a permanent ceasefire that leads to the withdrawal of all Zionist forces from the Gaza Strip and the return of the displaced to the homes from which they left. We also affirm our readiness to engage in an immediate prisoner exchange process that leads to the release of prisoners on both sides. Hamas calls on the Security Council to pressure the occupation to adhere to the ceasefire and stop the war of genocide and ethnic cleansing against our people, end quote. And finally, news from the occupied West Bank. Tamara Nassar reports that, quote, Israel approved the seizure of one of the largest chunks of land since the Oslo Accords were signed by Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization in the mid-1990s. Bezalel El Smotrich, the ultra far right Israeli finance minister, declared, declared nearly 2,000 acres of Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank as so called state lands. Smotrich said, quote, We are promoting settlement through hard work and in a strategic manner all over the country. The announcement was made on the eve of the arrival of U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Israel. Declaring Palestinian land as state land is a legal maneuver aimed at confiscating land belonging to Palestinians by interpreting an Ottoman law that was utilized in a completely different context nearly two centuries ago. Meanwhile, a Palestinian gunman opened fire on a bus near the Israeli settlement of Dolev in the occupied West Bank on Thursday. Mujahid Barakat Mansour was chased by Israeli troops for hours before being killed by a missile fired by an Apache helicopter. One Israeli soldier was killed and seven others were wounded during the operation. The settlement of Dolev was established in 1983 on lands from the nearby Palestinian villages of Jania, Ankinya, and Der Ibzi. Tamara writes that, quote, Israel has escalated its lethal attacks across the occupied West Bank under the guise of targeting emerging, emerging armed resistance. Israeli troops invaded the Nur Shams refugee camp on March 20th and killed four Palestinians, including two children. Dozens of Israeli armored vehicles, including bulldozers, raided the camp east of Tulkarim City in the northern occupied West Bank and began bulldozing roads and underground infrastructure in the camp. The Israeli army does this under the pretext of an increase in makeshift explosives planted beneath roads to target invading Israeli armored vehicles. Also on March 20th, an Israeli drone-fired missile struck a vehicle in the Janine refugee camp, killing four Palestinians associated with the Janine brigades, Tamara reports. During the funeral procession of the four men, Palestinians demanded that the Palestinian Authority release detainees affiliated with the Janine Brigade to allow, them, to allow them to bid farewell to their comrades before burial. The PA violently suppressed the protests by firing tear gas canisters at funeral attendees, resulting in injuries to four people, one of whom sustained a head injury. For much more, please read Tamara Nassar's latest report, Israel accelerates land theft in the West Bank on electronicintifada.net. And that's just some of the news from on the ground in Palestine over the last few days. Go to electronicintifada.net to read some of our fantastic new features by writers in Gaza now up on our homepage. And you're watching and listening to the Electronic Intifada live stream. I'm Nora Barrows-Friedman. 
Coming up, we'll get a full update from John Elmer on the latest military developments in Gaza and a conversation with Abdel Jawad Omar in the occupied West Bank. But first, Ali Abunima, we wanted to have a brief discussion on the latest updates in the New York Times October 7th mass rapes fraud. Um, Ali, uh, what can you tell us? What's new in this developing story? Oh, you're muted, Ali. Hi, Nora. Uh, thank you for that very sobering uh, news update. It's um, hard to believe that we're coming up to six months of this, and uh, each and every day um, there are new horrors. I just saw this morning, first thing, Hint Khodari, uh, the journalist, uh, we've had her on the live stream before talking about um, how her uncle and cousin were murdered by Israel. Yeah. Uh, I guess it would have been yesterday. And I just want to mention that to remind everyone, and I think people know this, that, that we can't get used to this. We can't normalize yeah. it. And um, it's very, very tough every day for uh, everyone in Gaza. Um, and yeah. we've said before, Nora, uh, we've ha every time we have this discussion, we say we hope it's the last time. But we know that we have to come back to this. I mean, there's good news in the sense that this narrative just keeps falling apart and there's bad news uh, that they keep trying to revive it. So I guess let's start with uh, the, the good part of that, which is um, the revelations, more revelations that... Um, actually, let's start with... Um, if you don't mind, uh, the story about Kochav El Kayam Levi. Nora, you'll remember her. Uh, yep. We spoke about her in our live stream on December. And Tamara, maybe you can just put up uh, item uh, one on the list I sent you, which shows us uh, just a reminder of when we spoke about uh, Kochav back in December. And let's look at item two, Tamara. And uh, just this is a new article I've done detailing in more detail some of what we're going to talk about today. But if we just scroll down, uh, you can see that um, right there, this was uh, that screenshot there. I don't know if we can zoom in on it, but you can see that's uh, a Haaretz story from um, the end of November. And that's a picture of El Kayam Levy, Kochav El Kayam Levy, who was everywhere in the media at that time, claiming to have, um, uh, claiming to be the head of something called the Civil Commission to investigate these claims of mass rape. And if we go to item 2B, Tamara, you can see that just actually a few days after that Haaretz article, uh, Kochav El Kayam Levy was actually welcomed uh, at the White House by the Joe Biden administration. And you can see there in the official White House uh, statement on that meeting from December 7th, 2023, they identify her as um, the chair of Israel's civil commission on October 7 crimes by Hamas against women and children. But um, what has emerged in the last few days is really quite incredible. It turns out that uh, El Kayam Levy won the Israel Prize. This is Israel's highest civilian cultural honor. Uh, it's awarded by um, a committee of, of the great and the good in Israel, and it's administered by Israel's education ministry. And the there's been a lot of infighting about this in Israel, and we're the beneficiaries of this because what has emerged is, uh, as so often when Israelis fight amongst themselves, is they, they tell truths that we're not supposed to hear. And so it turns out, and this was reported, we can go back to, uh, to the, the story, to um, item two, Tamara. Um, it turns out that... Uh, now in Israel, uh, Kochav El Kayam Levi and her civil commission 
are being exposed as a complete fraud. And it's really incredible. According to Yediat Ahronot, this is one of Israel's uh, biggest newspapers. They did a report just uh, a couple of days ago, and they actually find that her civil commission doesn't exist. It's a one-woman show. Uh, there is no civil commission. And moreover, the report which she won the Israel Prize for, this is supposedly a report detailing the um, crimes, the rapes, the sexual violence on October 7th, that report doesn't exist either. She hasn't uh, written uh, any such uh, report. And she seems to be something of a, uh, a financial grifter. And so it it's according to Ynet, what she's been doing is going around asking for money. She has this organization she calls the Devora Institute, and they've been sending around a budget for their work on this uh, so-called civil commission for 2024, a budget of $8 million, of which $1.5 million is earmarked for management and administration. And uh, she's been collecting a lot of donations. She, it's even been reported that she got a donation uh, from Ram Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan and previously the chief of staff to President Barack Obama. And uh, on her website, on the Devora Institute, it's, it lists uh, the government of Canada as one of her partners, I wasn't able to confirm in the time I had that she's actually received funding from the Canadian government, but that's something that uh, particularly our viewers and friends in Canada should be inquiring into. Um, and I don't know, Nora, do you want me to go into some of the the, the sort of uh, juicier revelations that have come out about uh, about this fraud. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. think it's really important. I mean, there's just the, you know, the the title of her uh, grifty organization, the Civil Commission, uh, sounds like a normal government assembled sort of entity. But, uh, and uh, and it, it seems to be that, that she was presenting it yeah. as some kind of official Israeli body. Right. And in fact, Ynet, the Yediat uh, Ahronot, quotes an Israeli government source saying um, that the following, this is in, in Ynet, at first she was very active and it was very nice. And then she started calling herself the civil commission. People got confused. Members of the US Congress turned to people who work with Israel and asked, what was this about? Did Israel create a con commission? It's a confusing name. And of course she didn't, um, create a commission, but she did apparently even fool the White House, whether they yeah. wanted to be fooled or not is another question. But they introduced her as if, or they spoke about her in that statement, as if she were an Israeli official. But here's what this government, Israeli government source says to Widenet, Widenet and to the question of, is there such a thing at all? Is there such a body? The answer is no. She is the body. She is the civil commission. Mm -hmm. And this same government source um, says that people are sort of treating her as kind of a pariah now in Israel because they say, this is again the government source quoted in Ynet, people disconnected from her because her investigation is not accurate. Um, and they say that she disseminated, for example, a story about Palestinian fighters slicing the belly of a pregnant woman a story proven to be untrue and spread it in the international media, end quote. That's actually what the Israeli government source told Ynet. And to be clear, the Israeli government source here is not saying, oh, this is bad, you know, spreading these lies is bad because it's an injustice to Palestinians. They're saying spreading the lies is bad because it damages our Hasbara, our right. public relations efforts, and we're already having enough trouble uh, in itself. But let's take a look um, at uh, this, because this is actually a big story in Israel. Right. Uh, Ynet reported on it, and Channel 13, which is one of the main TV channels in Israel, 
also did a report on all this fraud coming out. And let's take a look at that report. And what, what we'll do is we'll watch it. It's got, we, we have translated it from Hebrew and put English subtitles. We'll watch it and then I will summarize some of the points in it afterwards for those who are listening. So Great. you're just going to hear the Hebrew now and see the English subtitles for those who are watching. רביב דרוקר, ערב חדש, מבוכה חדשה סביב סאגת פרס ישראל, והפעם? כן, דוקטור כוכב אלקיים לוי עשתה עבודה, היא חתנית כלת פרס ישראל, היא עשתה עבודה ברוכה וחשובה, בלי שמץ של ציניות, בהעלאת המודעות הבינלאומית לזוועות המין שבוצעו על ידי החמאס. אבל התהייה עולה, קודם כל, היו מספר נשים מאוד בולטות שעשו פעילות בזה, לא ברור למה לקחו דווקא אותה, ולא נתנו לכולן. רוטל פרין קדרי, פרופסור ביטון, פרופסור ביטון, לא שלושה ביטון, כל הזמן טועים. נכון, סליחה. כן. ועוד כמה וכמה. הנימוק שנותנת הוועדה המכובדת בראשות יהורם גאון, הוא שהיא חיברה את דוח הזוועות, אלא שפה אנחנו מגלים שאין דוח זוועות, פשוט אין דוח כזה, לא נכתב דוח כזה, לא על ידה ולא על ידי אף אחד אחר חוץ מגופים בינלאומיים דווקא. יש איזה מכתב שהיא שלחה. שבועיים אחרי האסון, אחרי הטבח של 7 באוקטובר, שהוא ריכוז כותרות מהעיתונים, מכתב של כמה עמודים בודדים, ואין דוח כזה, אנחנו שואלים אותה הערב על הדברים האלה, וגם על הקשר המשפחתי שלה, היא אחייניתו של יעקב ברדוגו, הנה הדברים שהיא עונה. בטח שיש דוח כזה. הדוח הראשון שיצא, שהוא הדוח הראשון שיצא, הוא הדוח הראשון שיצא, הוא הדוח הראשון לגופי האו"ם, אין לי עוד מה לומר בנושא, חוץ מזה שאני גאה במשפחה שלי. אז כאמור, אפשר להראות את הדוח עוד מעט על המסך, אם צריך, זה מכתב של ארבעה עמודים, עמוד אחד זה חתימות, ועמוד אחד זה אמירות כלליות, ושני עמודים זה כותרות מהעיתונים פשוט, אף אחד לא ידע עוד כלום ב-20 לאוקטובר, זה לא דוח במובן של זה וזה עשו בבחורה ההיא שחס וחלילה נרצחה, זה הפשע, זה הראיות, אין דוח כזה, היא טוענת שהם עמלים על דוח כזה. אנחנו נשמח מאוד שהוא יצא יום אחד, אבל אם זה נימוק הוועדה, למה היא כן ואחרות לא, אז הנימוק הזה פשוט לא תקף ולא מחזיק מים. מה אומרים במשרד החינוך? במשרד החינוך אומרים, דומה לה, כנראה שאת זהה לתגובה שלה, שהיה דוח קודם, והיא עומדת, עומדת על דוח חדש, ומדברים על כך שהיא הפעילה נציבות אזרחית להעלאת המודעות. צריך לומר, גם הנציבות האזרחית זה שם מאוד מפוצץ, הנציבות זאת היא, והיא זאת הנציבות, אין איזה גוף גדול ש... נציבות שפועלת בכל העולם. So what you can see there, that's the uh, report that appeared on Channel 13, and that's the reporter Raviv Drucker talking to the anchor there. And the context for this is that there's sort of professional jealousy. Why did uh, Kochav El Kayam Levy get the Israel Prize when supposedly there are other women who've worked on um, exposing the, uh, as we now know, non-existent October 7th mass rapes. But what he says, uh, some of the key quotes, he says, they mention her starting a civil commission to raise awareness. It bears mentioning that the name civil commission is very bombastic. The commission is her and she is the commission. And he says that she was also the head of the Israel Prize Committee, awarded, said that, that uh, Al Kayam Levy received the award because she authored something called the Horrors Report, a report that uh, supposedly would detail the sexual violence on October 7th. But then Drucker says, We realize that there is no Horrors Report. There is simply so, no such report. It hasn't been written, not by her, not by anyone. Um, she claims. that she did write a report at the beginning uh, in October, and that's when she started to gain this international uh, prominence. But um, what Ra Raviv Drucker says is that that's just misleading. He says it's a four-page document, one page is signatures, one page is general statements, and two pages are just newspaper headlines. It's not a report in the sense that he and him did that did to that girl who, God forbid, was murdered. This is the crime. This is the evidence. There is no such report. So the whole thing appears to be a scam that was promoted 
uh, by none other than the Joe Biden White House by receiving this uh, woman and giving her the chance to present herself as if she were heading some official investigation. And as noted there, yeah, Raviv Drucker points out that um, there appears to be some kind of nepotistic element to this because El Kayam Levy is the niece of a man called Yaakov Berdugo, an advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu and a right wing commentator on um, Israeli army radio. Um, but that's not her only connection to uh, the Netanyahu administration. As I mentioned, her her organization, the Devorah Institute, which an Israeli government source described to um, to Ynet as a one-person outfit asking for one million dollar donations. Uh, it it has on its advisory board uh, the director, a former director of the Israeli Prime Minister's office, and three former officials from the Israeli National Security Council. So, um, the and then just one other thing to say about this. Uh, the Ynet story points out how she disseminated false propaganda, you know, these, these uh, atrocity claims. But that was known early on and was reported by uh, other independent journalists, including Max Blumenthal. So let's just take a look at uh, Tamara at Clip. Uh, this is um, item three, the video, which shows her actually lying uh, at an event in Harvard, I think this was back in uh, in November. Another image shows the body of a young woman stripped from the waist down, her underwear were torn, hung on one leg, and she was photographed uh, on the site at the Nova Music Festival. All right, so that that clip there, where she's claiming to describe a photo of a, a woman a victim at the Nova Rave or festival um, that was uh, attacked on October 7th uh, was in fact a photo of a Kurdish female fighter uh, fr from 2022 and not in Israel, in another country. So this fraud was exposed from early on, but it has now been um, exposed in the mainstream in Israel. But you heard, you heard it here first. <laughs> and of course, uh, none of that uh, interview uh, from Channel 13 that we showed has been uh, transcribed in English, except for the electronic intifada. I mean, wouldn't the New York Times want to look into that? You, um, you would you would think, because remember, this person was everywhere in the media and yeah. she was given credit and it's why she won the Israel Prize. So she right. fooled people inside Israel and outside Israel. Right. Uh, and, and let's see, you know, now that she's been exposed within Israel, if any of this makes it out into the mainstream media in the West, where so many people continue to insist that these lies upon lies about October 7th uh, sh should be taken seriously. Yeah. And just one more point on the Devorah Institute um, <laughs> that that she heads. It's, it's, her, uh, it's her operation. Um, that they are taking tax deductible donations from, uh, like, if you're in the U.S., um, you can make a tax deductible donation to this fraudulent grifty organization through, I believe it was the Jewish Communal Fund. That's right, the Jewish York. Communal yeah. Fund of New York. Yeah, and also, and she's she certainly, as we said, according to the Israeli press, co collected a huge amount of money, and that's not uncommon because what we've seen also is other um, organizations involved in the October Seven lies about. Uh, you know, atrocities, burn children and beheaded babies and so on, like Zaka, have also been going around. And our colleague Asa Win Stanley mm -hmm. actually has a new story up on EI about Zaka and noting how they went around uh, after October 7th and have been collecting uh, huge donations on the back of the lies that they're telling, uh, genocidal lies against uh, Palestinians. Right. Um, so... Uh, related, there have been uh, new revelations further debunking the New York Times's infamous uh, Screams Without Words story from December. Uh, you just published something on that yesterday. Uh, what's new there? 
Yeah, I mean, this is really incredible because people will recall um, the Screams Without Words story. We've talked about it extensively at the end of December by Jeffrey Gettleman, Anad Schwartz, and Adam Seller that has fallen apart. Absolutely nothing is left of it in terms of its key claims. And yet the New York Times is still, still has it up. And there was this one story uh, in it, one particularly horrifying story, where, where it's claimed that an Israeli army medic on October 7th went into a house in Kibbutz Be'eri, this is one of those colonial settlements we've talked about repeatedly, and saw um, the bodies of two teenage girls in a room. And I quote from the uh, New York Times story of December 28th, and again, I warn viewers that this description from the New York Times is graphic. This is what they reported in December about the two teenage girls allegedly found by this Israeli army paramedic. Quote, one was lying on her side, boxer shorts ripped, bruises by her groin. The other was sprawled on the floor face down, uh, pajama pants pulled to her knees, bottom exposed, semen smeared on her back. Uh, the New York Times also says that the paramedic did not document the scene and that they only spoke to this Israeli military uh, member with permission of the Israeli army and on condition that he not be identified. So again, the sourcing was already very vague. And as we pointed out when we addressed this story back in uh, January, uh, it had already been debunked by Mondo Weiss. Then in early March, it was debunked again by uh, The Intercept, which actually identified the two teenage girls, and they did an extensive story um, showing that they, they, that they were not, in fact, uh, sexually assaulted. And then comes the New York Times, which just uh, yesterday published, uh, or on, uh, excuse me, on um, uh, March 25th, so this would have been Monday, Monday um, published a story conceding that this that this claim in their original report is false. And they say, quote, new video has surfaced that undercuts the account of an Israeli military pa paramedic who said two teenage girls killed in the Hamas-led terrorist attack on October 7th were sexually assaulted. And they cite footage taken by an Israeli soldier quote, which was viewed by leading community members in February and by the Times this month, and it shows the bodies of three female victims fully clothed and with no apparent signs of sexual violence at a home where many residents had believed the assaults occurred. Um, the kibbutz uh, Be'eri residents who viewed the footage said that in no other home in Be'eri were two teenage girls killed and they concluded from the video that the girls had not been sexually assaulted. And I'll also add that the UN report by Pramila Patton that we talked about and, and wrote about at the Electronic Intifada that we criticized for really regurgitating uh, mostly Israeli government propaganda, even that report says that they could not substantiate a single claim of sexual violence in Kibbutz Berry, and that several of the most prominently reported claims, um, and I believe that includes this, this one, were unfounded in the words of the UN report. And there's another wrinkle here, which is incredible, which is when we went back and looked, these two sisters, uh, and they were identified as uh, N, and uh, uh, they, they were identified by the intercept uh, as Y and N Sharabi, aged 13 and 16. Um, one of them was actually missing for more than a week after October 7th and was not identified. Her body was not identified until late October. So that makes it even more bizarre that an Israeli paramedic could have claimed to see all this. And that's to say, you know, it's hard to sort out now what actually did and did not happen. But all of these um, contradictory details that were known at the time the New York Times 
published its original story should have made them stop and look for corroboration before publishing this story, but they did not do that. No. Um, and I mean, now that the, uh, you know, that their original story, the New York Times' original story has now been um, fully debunked, uh, little piece by piece, uh, it, there's really nothing left of that story. Um, but is there any indication that it's planning to, you know, correct screams without words or or do what it should be doing and and retract and apologize so far no uh, the only thing the new york times has done is they inserted sort of a misleading update into right. the original story as if this story hadn't already been debunked at the time it was published in December. So they're trying to give the impression that this is new information when in fact it was already known that this story was false or unlikely or dubious at the time they published their story, but they didn't want to know it then. So they don't call it a correction, they call it an update. And we wrote to the New York Times and asked them if they still stand by the original Screams Without Words article, if they're planning to uh, retract it, if they've carried out an internal investigation and um, they uh, they haven't replied to us. See there, there's the update yeah, on the screen. Right the they say newly released video viewed by the Times. So they're trying to give the impression that the, the story was solid prior to this newly released video when in fact uh, the story had already been debunked um, at the time they, they originally published it. Um, in December. Incredible. Um, and uh, I mean, you said this at the beginning, but like, uh, will this issue ever end? What, 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 uh, what do we, what updates can we possibly update to this like already completely, you know, dissolved story? Well, you know, it's curious. So this, the New York Times publishes a story on March 25th debunking its own reporting, which it's still confusingly standing by at the same time. And then um, the next day, they publish a new sensational story. Uh, this one here we see on the screen with the headline, Israeli hostage says she was sexually assaulted and tortured in Gaza. And this is a 4,000 word story uh, about an Israeli woman called uh, Amit um, Susana, who was held in Gaza for several weeks, and she was released in November. And now she's claiming, she's come out and said that while she was held in Gaza, uh, one of uh, her guards, a man she identifies as Muhammad, forced her to carry out a sexual act, which she does not describe in detail. And um, they build a 4,000-word story about this. There's no way to, to, to know, you know, she, she may be lying, she may be telling the truth. We can't evaluate that. Um, what we can say is this is very curious that this is coming out now, uh, four or five months after she was released. She, uh, if we look at item six, she gave a press conference uh, in January. And again, this was now, I would say, she was released at the end of November. So this is more than a month after she was released. She gave a press conference in January, which is on video. We've watched the video in which she makes no mention whatsoever of this assault. Now, you could say, okay, she didn't want to talk about it very well. Uh, but What's, again, uh, been pointed out, if we look at uh, Tweet 7 uh, by, uh, if I may call them, friend of the show, Zay Squirrel, the uh, anonymous investigator who has revealed so many uh, important details about this, that when this story was launched yesterday uh, by the New York Times, it, it was part of a coordinated uh, push by Israeli government accounts that were all suddenly pushing it, as if uh, it somehow corroborates the lies about mass rapes on October 7th. There's important things to point out here, which is that the 
4,000 word New York Times story about Amit Susana doesn't use the word rape. It doesn't claim that this incident, if it happened, was part of any systematic pattern. It describes um, an isolated incident, and it actually quotes Basim Naim, a, a senior official of Hamas, saying that we would want to investigate this because Hamas has been very clear um, that they do not tolerate uh, this this kind of uh, assault on uh, captives. But um, it's really, uh, again, the context of this is so important because the New York Times is devoting 4,000 words to this one alleged incident. Uh, when, um, if we take a look, Tamara, I don't know if we can bring up a tweet number eight, which is from Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, from the uh, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, and we saw a um, a uh, clip of her in the news brief. And here, here's what uh, um, Francesca Albanese said on March 24th. She said, I lost count of how many renowned journalists interviewed me on the alleged mistreatment of and sexual abuse against Palestinian women by Israeli forces and never published an article on this. So that's the context in which we have to look at this Amit Susana story. I don't think we can be enge engaged in a debate about did this happen, didn't it happen. E even if it did happen, um, it uh, as I noted, it doesn't provide any corrobor corroboration whatsoever for the claims about October 7th. Uh, it doesn't describe any kind of pattern. And we have to ask why the New York Times would focus a massive, huge story on this while continuing to ignore, uh, along with the rest of the mainstream media, the um, the uh, testimonies and evidence of sexual abuse and humiliation and mistreatment of Palestinian women and men by Israeli forces that uh, are coming out continuously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the silence speaks volumes there. Um, what, uh, yeah, what What can we learn from this? Why, just, just for a minute, um, maybe we could just talk about the, the timing of this um, as Israel is, uh, you know, flouting the UN Security Council resolution, of course, for a ceasefire, as it uh, continues to cut off uh, UN aid deliveries to the north of Gaza um, as Israel becomes more and more of uh, an isolated pariah state around the world. Um, why does the New York Times and other uh, other outlets like like it continue to launder these uh, these uh, these stories of hoaxes, you know, developed and and put out there by grifters? They're deeply complicit in this. I mean, these stories are being being planted, being shaped with the Israeli government. The original Screams Without Words story was largely sourced from the Israeli military. The fact that we see these same stories repeated time after time after time um, in publication after publication, and it's this echo chamber that, that gives them more credibility by repetition, even though th there's no evidence there. And I think a major problem of Israel's mass rapes narrative which is a, a result of the debunkings that we and others have done, is that there's no victim and they desperately needed a victim. And so now they've come up with a victim, albeit not from October 7th. This this uh, woman, Amit right. Susana, doesn't claim that this uh, incident of this um, vaguely described assault occurred on October 7th. She's saying it happened in uh, while she was in captivity. And so this is someone you can now present and try to silence the critics with, to say, mm -hmm. ah, you see, finally, there is a victim. And if you don't believe this, you don't believe women. But it's important to recognize that, that this isn't some organic thing of, a, uh, of this woman deciding to come out and speak and break her silence. This is a big story, which the New York Times and clearly the Israeli propaganda ap apparatus that has been promoting it 
invested a lot of time and effort in into and that's the context you have to see it in if this were a woman coming forward someone for example like tara reed who accused uh president joe biden of sexually assaulting her in the 19 uh, you know many years ago but during the last campaign uh, she came out and said this happened to me and she had contemporary witnesses from the time who said yeah she told us about this at the time and uh, again, Zay Squirrel went back and looked at how the New York Times reported on Tara Reid as a woman coming out with very little support and saying, this happened to me. A powerful man did this to me. And the New York Times was completely dismissive and actually went out and, and just did character assassination as ta against Tara Reid. So again, it's not about whether I sitting here can say, what this person is saying is true or not true, but I can look at how the the propaganda apparatus treats a person who is going against someone they support, for example, Joe Biden, or serving a power they support. For example, in this case, the testimony of Amit Susana uh, is serving Israel's genocidal anti-Palestinian narrative, and therefore they treat her as if there's no way she could be telling other than the truth. And that's what we have to be attentive to, how these stories uh, are presented. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ali. Uh, it's uh, really important work uh, uncovering these lies and fabrications um, and holding the New York Times to account. Um, an, an impossible task. Yeah. <laughs> Holding them to account is an impossible task. And I think that's important. <laughs> you know, I'll just say this about it because uh, the, the people still have the idea that the New York Times is somehow doing its job badly when it tells these sorts of lies. But this right. is exactly, exactly its its job is to, is to tell these lies. And, you know, they... Again, we go back to this because it's it's so crucial. The New York Times promoted the lies about weapons of mass destruction and um, helped lay the groundwork for the U.S. aggression against Iraq, causing untold damage, untold deaths, untold disruption to millions of lives. And then later, after the deed was done, they came out with a mea culpa and said, oh, you know, maybe we should have been a bit more skeptical. I won't be surprised if the New York Times does do that in the future with this when it's too late, yeah. when the job is already done. And the purpose of those mea culpas is never to actually um, say we learned the lesson and now we'll, we'll stop lying for the government and stop lying for Israel. The purpose is to restore their image in the eyes of the public so they can then come out and do it again. They can tell right. more lies for the powerful again. This is who they are, and this is their job. That's right. And they'll keep collecting, you know, polk awards and Pulitzers um, for this kind of just... Yeah, like uh, Jeffrey Gettleman. Exactly. The, the author of that fraudulent uh, mass rape story of December 28th, Pulitzer Prize winner. I wonder if he'll he'll be nominated and maybe win one for for the this this bunch of lies. Let's I see. Would not be surprised. Well, thank you again, Ali. And you are watching and listening to the Electronic Intifada's live stream. Let's bring John on. Hello, John. Hi, hey guys. That story is incredible. Uh, treating the New York Times treating a story like a wiki, where they yeah. just insert an update in an already published story, is just remark it's scandalous yeah i mean our our colleague michael brown was talking yesterday about how uh we couldn't he couldn't remember if if like that you know it's it, in any other story it would be a correction and then there might be a retraction but but to to categorize it as an update and insert it into the text is um as, as if level. As, as if again and i i just i can't stress this enough as if the doubts about this story had not already been exposed prior right. to its original publication. Right. It's so misleading. It's it's so duplicitous. And uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. In their own newsroom too, right, Ali? Like right. The, inside their own newsroom, there's disagreements about this. So even inserting that update is, uh, it's, it's just a scandalous story. And to use that story to justify 
the brutality that we're seeing in Gaza is yeah. enraging. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. It's the manufacturing of consent for this genocide. Six months in. Um, so, John, uh, you're gonna bring us some of the latest news and videos from specifically the battle that uh, has been raging around the Al Shifa med medical complex in Gaza City. Uh, what we talked about at the beginning in the news report, um, and you're also going to detail the remarkable story of a West Bank resistance fighter who held off the Israeli military in the hills around Ramallah. Uh, Tamara reported extensively on that. What have uh, what you got for us? Yeah, so the significance, of course, of this battle we've seen um, in Shifa Hospital um, is that um, the Palestinians have resisted around the hospital and fought valiantly against this Israeli uh, invasion of the hospital. Um, one of three hospitals, as you said, Nora, in your introduction, that is being raided simultaneously. Um, the Israelis are using these hospitals as propaganda uh, features of their war as well. Um, and they're focusing, as we've said from November, because following this war uh, hour by hour, it was very clear uh, immediately in the early days of the ground invasion, as we reported on the live stream, um, that it appeared um, right away like their operation was destined for the hospital and no other place, that that was the goal of the operation, was to attack the hospitals. Um, in November, the justification for the Shifa raid was, of course, that there was a command and control center, that, that they, they made this fictitious uh, underground secret lair um, that Hamas is using. Interestingly, in this raid of Shifa Hospital, there isn't any um, claims about that, um, although the previous justification would seem to suggest that the Palestinians would use this tunnel apparatus in the hospital. Um, but this time, now six months on, um, they don't need to lie uh, in detail anymore. Um, they can just lie superficially, um, and it works. Um, the Israeli, as, as Nora reported in her introduction, there's brutality all throughout this raid on Shifa Hospital, as uh, is obvious if you raid a hospital full of patients, injured people, um, and their families looking after them. Um, that's brutal crimes. Um, the Israeli army says that they haven't um, they haven't hurt one single person who's not a terrorist at Shifa Hospital. Um, the lies are just they they're not even trying anymore um, on these lies. And so I want to report today on the resistance um, around the hospital because um, the focus um, of of the Palestinian resistance in the north has been to um, to fight back against this hospital attack. The hospitals put the resistance in an impossible position. Um, if you defend the hospital, you cut it off uh, from people trying to access it. Um, but the goal by Israel of these hospital raids is to dismantle the hospital. Um, it's what they're, when they leave the hospital, the hospital will be no longer functioning. Um, it's not a raid looking for people inside the facility. It's the dismantling of the facility. Um, and we're seeing this from the Israelis um, in place of what was previously during the ground operation. Um, they would at least say that they were um, nominally entering the tunnels. They were at least entering the first layer of tunnels in some cases. They're not even saying that anymore. Um, they're just attacking hospitals. They attacked uh, Al Amal Hospital in Khan Yunus and dismantled it. Um, you know, only days after the hospital had got up and functioning, um, we watched for weeks as they besieged Nasser Hospital and dismantled it. And the Palestinians got the hospital back up and running, uh, and the Israelis invaded it again. So uh, we're clearly seeing, and we've seen it from the start. Um, but now we just have obvious confirmation that these are the objectives for the Israeli military, um, is to dismantle these hospitals. Um, and the international press is letting them. It's not the front page of the New York Times um, this round, um, that ho the Shifa hospital is being sacked, um, which we're seeing. So let's, let's take a look at some of these videos from this past week. And again, everything that we're gonna show you is just from the last week. 
Um, and let's start with number one here tomorrow. So this is the fighting around Shifa Hospital, and we can see tracer bullets here. We've taken out the audio as usual, but you can see there we're watching uh, a gunfight um, on the ground level, um, and we're watching now a fighter moving through the rubble and hitting a Merkava tank um, that's stationed around the hospital. Uh, these tanks entered Shifa, um, the raid on Shifa through the Nitzarim corridor that we reported on last week. If you didn't catch that episode, um, go back and check that out. We talked about how um, Israel's uh, creating a military highway to cut the Gaza Strip in half and allow them to raid into Gaza City, um, which is one of the reasons why the resistance had to put up uh, a fight over this, because this can't be normalized. Um, that they can just move into the city and raid these hospitals in this way. So we're seeing, uh, again, one of the 1,200 Yassin uh, shots uh, throughout this war just from uh, the Kassam Brigades. This is a Kassam Brigades video. Um, we're watching a Yassin uh, moving through the rubble, hitting the tank there. Um, another strike on the tank. Um, if we could go to number two, tomorrow. Um, this is all happening while inside the hospital, uh, patients are being attacked. Um, and so outside the hospital, this battle is raging. We're seeing here a second Yassin shooter, um, along with a cameraman, he's setting up his sights there. And somebody was asking uh, last week about what kind of tracking system um, these Yassins have, they just have that sight. Um, there's no uh, heat seeking capability on these um, on the RPG round. The um, effectiveness of the RPG of the Yassin is the proximity. It's that fighters can get within a half a block um, with this man portable shoulder fired rocket. Um, and we can see here we're seeing two different camera angles on this single tank being hit. And all of these videos that I'm going to show you coming up will, will show similar things, which is that the fighters are able to move around the city. Um, there's there, The clearing operations are targeted against civilians in the neighborhood of Shifa Hospital, but these fighters are still moving around. Um, and six months on, five months into the ground invasion, and we're still not seeing Israelis outside of their tank defending these areas. Um, and so fighters have freedom of movement um, around this area, around Shifa Hospital in this case, but we've seen it um, in various other places. And we can maybe switch to the next one after this shot here tomorrow. Um, it's difficult to see if that's a counter uh, measure here. So now we're seeing an elevated uh, shot. And if we can see this Merkava tank has his barrel uh, pointed down the road and he's using this building as cover, um, and the Palestinian resistance fighter is able to uh, clearly hit the tank on the turret um, in between the hull of the tank uh, and the turret, which is one of the weakest spots on the vehicle. And maybe when we go through it this time, we can pause it tomorrow on the uh, on the hit because it's if you could see that the tank barrel pointed down the street here. Um, and Kassam freezes this shot here to show you, you can see the tank round there uh, exploding out of the barrel from clearly a direct hit uh, on that tank. The tank driver uh, and commander is up in that turret area. Um, and, and so we're seeing a direct hit and they're seeing footage here filmed from a separate location uh, by the Palestinian um, resistance. And we're seeing these media ops um, be embedded in these uh, operations, in these uh, attacks, um, in the same way. We're not seeing any shortage of this after five months uh, of ground invasion um, at this point. So clearly a, a direct hit uh, on that. And the Israelis claimed in the first day, uh, first days of this now, more than a week-long operation in Shifa, that uh, a commander from their com uh, forward command team um, was killed um, and another uh, injured and we, they didn't say which incidents there are but we can see from that shot that that uh, appears to be one of them the Israelis are still not reporting their casualties they said in in the new year that they would be reporting their casualties every day um, and they just stopped doing that within a few weeks in January and the the reports from uh, the Israelis of their casualties continues to be um, 
commanders there they seem to report the commanders um that are killed in these but um it's unclear if after the fact we're going to hear about the, their true casualty numbers um people are uh, you know, constantly asking me what I believe the numbers are. Um, and I, I don't want to speculate because um, we don't know. Um, from the Israeli media reports seem to suggest that it's at least double what they're reporting um, at this point. They've reported um, 250 killed just in the ground uh, invasion um, so it's not clear and i don't want to put a number on it because we just don't know because they have not been reporting their casualties and as we know from the battle from hamid town last week um, that their commanders aren't even reporting um, to the families themselves the casualties so there's um, there's real difficulty putting the information together um, we know that from certain hospitals in the south alone um, claim more casualties at their ho at their single hospital in the south than um, Israel has said in the overall war. Um, so we know that that the numbers don't add up, and the Israeli media um, has started to report on that. But of course, to just reiterate to the audience, um, anyone reporting out of Israel is subject to the military censor. Um, which would pull all of this information out of any news report. And we also know that the Israelis have stationed uh, military uh, people in every single hospital in Israel to control information coming out of those hospitals. And we've seen um, doctors in Israel protesting against that because um, they, they believe that the numbers should be released. And in previous wars, um, the Israeli numbers were released. So... Um, their attempt to to keep morale up um, by lying about their casualties, it's not clear that that's uh, a long-term strategy that's going to work out for their um, for their state. So maybe we could go to the next one tomorrow here. Um, and again, we're watching fighters moving through the buildings here. Um, we get a good shot of the Yassin fighter moving into position. We've taken out the audio, but you can hear him communicating with his spotter. He sees a Merkava tank straight forward, straight in front of him um, and, and fires. And you can hear in the audio, the fighters talking to each other because the spotter is looking for the tank ahead of time um, so that the fighter isn't sitting in a window um, waiting um, like the Israelis do, sitting in a window uh, waiting uh, to fire. Uh, the spotter tells them when the vehicle is getting into position and then the fighter moves in, um, immediately fires um, and then turns away um, and gets out of the, the building because the Israelis will um, target the building from where the fire came from. That's why we don't see the fighters uh, lingering on the aftermath of these um, of these. Uh, Yassin strikes. Um, so we could go to the next one here tomorrow. Um, again, we're, we're showing the volume of these reports. These are all from the vicinity of Shifa Hospital. Another Merkava tank hit there. Um, uh, we're seeing it from an elevated firing position, which I've said is, um, is where the tank is the weakest on the top. Um, it's built to withstand uh, roadside bombs and buried bombs underneath the vehicle, but they're not as strong um, up top because these Israeli tanks are built for um, the Israelis to fight these kind of wars of occupation, not against another army, um, but against, uh, uh, against a guerrilla force um, that doesn't have aircraft and tank fire. Um, and various things that you would want to protect your vehicle against. So these are um, hitting vehicles in vulnerable spots. And this is one of the uh, urban warfare. Um, the realities of urban warfare is that um, there's an advantage for the Palestinian fighters who can get up to elevated firing positions um, and, and fire on these vehicles. So that's another Merkava tank. Um, if we can go to the next one tomorrow. And here's a good shot, uh, a, a good shot of a Yassin uh, archer, um, as they call them, um, attempting to hit this moving tank. It looks like he misses because the Israelis have built, and you can see in this footage, a sand berm uh, along this corridor. And so they're using the Nitzarim corridor to come from Israel um, across uh, east-west, across the Gaza Strip, and then they're moving up the waterfront. 
Um, and so they have built berms um, along the edges of these streets um, to protect their vehicles as they're moving up. And so it's a difficult shot on a moving vehicle, but I've shown you a number of times in these videos that the Palestinian resistance is able to hit these moving vehicles. And there's a good shot of the Yassin, um, the Gaza-made um, RPG-7 clone. Um, and you can see the tandem warhead there uh, that has two um, that has two warheads, the initial warhead um, to defeat um, the uh, reactive armor um, or to um, open up the original hole, an original hole, and then the second round follows through. So these are the weapons that Palestinians have built and clearly have had stockpiles uh, sufficient enough to fight a five month ground war. We don't see any indication of these weapons running out. Um, which seems to indicate that likely the production of these weapons is continued throughout the war um, because we're seeing fighters in all of these videos choose weapons that are appropriate for the conditions. It doesn't appear. Um, and, and again, we're looking for these kind of pieces of evidence, um, but, but we're not, there's no reason to believe that um, the Palestinians, um, that the Palestinian resistance in Gaza um, launched the attack on October 7th without being prepared for, um, for this ground war that would follow. And all indications are showing that. And the, the Israelis say that they have um, eliminated battalions, that they need to go into Rafa because there's four battalions left in Rafa. But these are just arbitrary distinctions. They don't match, um, Qassam battalions don't match to uh, fighter sizes in the way that other uh, militaries um, do. So to say that there's a, a, a battalion um, isn't indicating the number of fighters that are there. Um, and the defeat of these battalions that the Israelis have claimed is just clearly not true. Um, they're using arbitrary distinctions of combat ineffectiveness, which is a, a criteria that is one third fighting ability um, degraded. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing along the waterfront here that that vehicle, that tank is showing you the route to Shifa Hospital. And this is something that the Israelis have prepared um, because they they want to stay inside Gaza in these buffer zones and then raid into these territories, into the urban built up areas. And so this Shifa raid is into the built up areas. And the previous raid before that was in Zaytun. Um, which was um, a ferocious battle. As soon as they came into the north, um, they're attacked by um, clearly functioning um, guerrilla units um, that are functioning, what appears to be functioning still in their um, army formations. They're not um, ragtag groups anymore, which is what would happen um, were the Israelis to be successful. But we're not seeing any signs of Israeli success. And these ho these hospital raids um, are proof of that. Because if we were seeing um, Israeli military successes, we would see the Israelis overrunning positions, um, finding weapons caches, finding factories. Um, and they're not, not seeing any of that, let alone finding their own people, which they haven't been able to do. Um, they don't have any intelligence on the ground five months into this war um, that allows them to carry out any kind of operation except against a soft target. Um, like a hospital. So maybe we go to the next one after this shot here tomorrow. Um, so we're seeing, again, fighters moving all through this area. These I've organized these chronologically. So these um, are chronological through the week of the fight. Um, uh, Palestinians able to get within uh, a couple hundred feet here maximum um, of these vehicles. And again, in all of these videos, you can see just the the utter destruction all around and the raid on Shifa um, involved pushing 3,700 displaced people off the Shifa campus. Um, it involved pushing out uh, injured people from their hospital rooms. Um, and then the sacking of the hospital, there's been more than 800 arrests um, in, in this operation. And they stole, the Israelis stole $3 million in cash from the hospital and bragged about that. Um, they've done that, of course, in numerous places, um, both in Gaza and the West Bank, stole large amounts of money um, and, and bragged about it as if they're somehow uh, winning the war by attacking these hospitals, um, stealing money, pushing patients out. Um, and what we see from the Palestinians is um, 
is consistent resistance. As soon as the Israelis were in, these videos started coming out immediately. They come out quickly um, and responsive to the operations um, themselves. So we can go to the next one here tomorrow. Here we're seeing a fighter use a loophole in, in the wall where we see the Israelis knock massive holes out of the wall that makes them very obvious. We can see on this footage the Palestinian fighter in the staircase filming through a tiny loophole with his camera so that the fighter is protected by the wall. Um, we can see there, but he's filming out and we're seeing the, the fighter load up. Um, an F-7 frag, fragmentation warhead, uh, North Korean fragmentation warhead that's being fired here against a troop position um, in, in, during the Battle uh, of Shifa. So maybe go to the next one here tomorrow. There's a good shot of, of the weapon. He's pulling his sight up there. Um, and that, that's the only, there's no optical uh, sight on the Yassin. Um, but we've seen the Palestinians training with these weapons and getting these weapons in the hands of all their fighters um, has been the, the significant strategy of this battle plan for the last um, five months. So maybe we can go to 8B here um, tomorrow because we're going to see um, the Palestinians here use a Sawath um, explosively formed penetrator against an Israeli tank. So not just Yassin's. Um, but we're seeing it positioned here. We're watching the tank move by and being hit directly on the side by the Shawath, which penetrates 650 millimeters of armor, um, more than the tank has on that side. And if you can see in this footage, when we loop back through again, you can see the blast wave uh, ripple out from this attack. Um, and we see, again, here, fighters tracking the vehicles. They're able to have spotters in different spots uh, of the battle communicating with the shooters and then a cameraman getting it from a separate angle. So we're seeing fighters all over this neighborhood carrying out this resistance um, while the Israelis are sacking the hospital inside the hospital. This is a remotely detonated Shoa 3. Um, this is the most... Um, the most recent, the most advanced of um, Qassam's Shawath um, IEDs that they have been working on for uh, more than 15 years on these designs. Um, and so again, you can see when this goes off, you can see the blast wave, the significance of that detonation against that vehicle, um, which will have to be presumably um, towed out of there. So maybe we can go to number nine after this here tomorrow. Because um, we've also seen um, sniper uh, operations, Al Ghul sniper operations with the Palestinian made um, 50 cal sniper rifle. Um, <clears throat> so this is this this shot is a sniper versus a sniper. We can see the Palestinian fighter is inside, completely inside the building, concealed. We're showing Kassam is showing us footage here that shows they're they're identifying that shows you can see the lens of the Israeli sniper um, in the sunlight uh, reflecting, and so the Palestinians can identify their position, um, and we see the sniper. Um, with a direct hit on the Israeli sniper, which is who is carrying out these massacres around the hospital that we're seeing this brutal footage of um, people being shot coming and going from the hospital are from these sniper positions. Um, and so the um, Palestinian resistance being able to target these snipers um, is more than just taking out an individual um, because these sniper positions are so deadly for the Palestinians um, in the neighborhood. So we're seeing another Al Ghul sniper attack. Um, the Israelis are showing um, their position um, with curtains pulled back, um, making it obvious that they're inside that position. You can see their spyware, um, their surveillance technology there um, being exposed. Um, and we're seeing another sniper, um, successful sniper operation. Um, all of these, these casualty reports clearly, again, not matching what we're seeing in the videos being reported from the ground. Um, and here we're seeing Kassam in this video identify the smoke screen that's being put up by the Israelis to evacuate um, the injured or killed um, from this attack. And so this is um, one sni uh, sniper attack. And, um, 
there's a number of them. So maybe we could go to number 10 uh, here tomorrow because this is a sniper uh, against an Israeli command post and they're monitoring the command post. We can see here um, they're identifying a number of Israeli soldiers uh, in this position, taking up a position inside a house uh, inside the neighborhood um, and using it as a fighting position. Um, and in this video, we're seeing two Al Ghuls. This is the first time that the, on video that we have seen on film uh, multiple shooters at the same target. So we're seeing multiple Al Ghul sniper rifle um, uh, targeting, and we see each one of these rounds hitting the window where the soldiers are inside. Um, and you can clearly see on this video um, that both of those targets uh, are being hit successfully um, from multiple positions at the same spot. Um, so again, that's the first time that we've seen uh, multiple snipers on the same target um, so far during this war. Um, and there was a video released um, last week, uh, might have been a week and a half ago now, by Al Jazeera Arabic. So there, Qassam showing us both. So Al Jazeera Arabic got footage from Qassam here from um, a late January sniper operation that we reported on here on the Electronic Intifada um, that was a, targeting the deputy commander of the Shaldag Special Forces Unit, Air Force Special Forces Unit of the IDF, who took part in the, who was an officer during the raid of Shifa the first time around. And so Qassam provided this extended footage to Al Jazeera um, that shows um, the way that these sniper units are tracking um, because the sniper operation isn't just the shooting, it's the tracking and surveillance um, and professionalization that goes into these operations um, that we don't see on the videos because Kassam gives us tight crops of the videos. But back in the end of January, uh, we reported that this um, sniper attack um, was on um, an officer who took part in the um, Shifa raid, which the Israelis didn't say that he was sniped. They said that um, during one of the casualty reports, they said that the um, Shaldag um, commander was part of the Shifa raid, but they didn't say that he was sniped. So um, this was confirmation from Qassam that they were monitoring the position um, and, and were able to identify the leadership in this unit um, and successfully target them. So if we could go back to the, the previous video, let me just um, show you the narration here. Um, because we're seeing that Qassam sees the, the Israeli position um, and tracks it over multiple days um, and watching which soldiers, seeing how they interact with each other. So here's the footage that we have never seen before um, that shows the position um, of the Israelis using this sports club in the area as a base um, in the Al Ramal area in the Talahawa um, area of Gaza City in the heart of Gaza City, um, and so Kassam is showing us this extended footage, and this is something that after the war I think we're going to see a lot of this because the Kassam edits are very tight edits, um, so we don't necessarily see all the battle scene um, that leads up to the operation. But in this case, um, Qassam confirmed this to Al Jazeera, that they knew that this was the commander um, and that they were following him um, and, and, and able to target him um, based on his position. So it's not just against any soldier. Um, they, they tracked that um, operation and was able to pick um, the commander of that. So um, that was pretty remarkable footage and confirmation of something that we brought to you on, Al on uh, Electronic Intifada live stream before Al Jazeera did in uh, in late January, uh, early February. Um, and the Al Jazeera report showed uh, more details about the Al Ghul sniper rifle that we've brought to you um, before on this show. But um, seeing that extended footage was just really remarkable. I wanted to bring that to you guys. Um, and show you that extended footage. So maybe we can go to number 12 here tomorrow because it's not just around Shifa Hospital that they're fighting. This is a video that I showed you a couple of weeks back from Zahra, which is in the uh, northwest corner of the middle camps area, attacking um, from the south to the north, attacking the corridor that the Israelis have set up, um, uh, cutting the Gaza Strip in, in half. And so we see the fighter emerging from an attack tunnel here and firing between these two trees. 
Um, but now we saw this week, um, if we go to the next one here tomorrow, we saw this week um, another video released by Kassam showing the same tunnel again, um, using the same tunnel um, to carry out an operation, to carry out the same operation. And there's a number of interesting details in this um, shot. We're seeing them use a tandem 85 here, um, which is a, a Kassam invention um, taking um, a previous warhead and adding a second charge to it to make it um, to make the um, out of date stocks uh, useful again. And we're seeing a direct hit on here um, on a Merkava tank um, from this attack tunnel. The fighter is just emerging from the attack tunnel and there's this call the tow truck as he goes back down uh, into the tunnel, um, clearly indicating that there's several fighters at least in the tunnel. Um, and, and call the tow truck. Um, actually, the, the literal translation, he says, is call the winch um, to come pick them up, which is actually what we've seen um, the Israelis use to tow these tanks. At the front of um, their tanks, they have uh, winches, and that's what they are dragging out um, the hulks of their defeated tanks that we've um, seen Kassam show them before. So that's in Zahra. Call a tow truck, I think, uh, that that fighter that that's a moment that will carry on after the war, um, and I wish we could bring you the audio in these, but we're trying to keep these videos on air. So um, I just wanted to show you that that's a in, and in this uh, operation we're we're hearing gunfire around. So these fighters are emerging from a tunnel um, that they have used before um, to defeat Israeli armored vehicles um, in the middle camp. So it's not just uh, it's not just fighting around. Um, around Shifa Hospital. If we go to the next one tomorrow, um, this is a Sarail Quds operation in the middle camps, east um, east of the middle camps in the buffer zone. We're we're um, we're seeing a the cope cage canopy um, slat armor that the Israelis put on top of their vehicles to protect against drone attacks after the drone attacks on. October 7th, previously, Israeli tanks did not have those cages above them. But after the efficacy of the Palestinian resistance on October 7th, the Israelis uh, up-armored their vehicles before the ground invasion. So we're watching Sarai al-Quds, this is Islamic Jihad here, watching an Israeli position and um, taking apart here, we're seeing uh, a Malutka uh, anti-tank um, a wire-guided anti-tank missile. This is one of the most common um, anti-tank missiles. It's a Soviet anti-tank missile. The Iranians have made a clone of this missile, but this looks like an original based on the command center that we're seeing him, uh, the fighters hook up here, um, which directs the missile once it's been fired by that joystick to control where, um, where the missile um, hits. And so this is an interesting uh, video from Sarail Kuds because they show us the whole operation of setting up um, this weapon and deploying it. We have seen this weapon referred to in field reports during um, this during the ground war, but we haven't seen it actually be used. And here's a mortar team. So Sarail Kuds is monitoring that Israeli position in the buffer zone. Um, then they're coordinating with their anti-tank missile unit and their mortar units to target this um, to target this Israeli position. And now Sarail Quds is showing us again um, footage of the medical evacuation um, from the scene and another footage of medical evacuations by helicopter of the Israelis well within range of the weapons that we've just shown um, on this show today, um, within range of the Al Ghul rifle, within range of this anti-tank weapon. Um, and they're not targeting them. Their uh, Palestinian resistance is apparently not targeting um, these medical medevac helicopters, which is um, an interesting thing that we've been following throughout this war um, that appears to be um, continues. And so we're seeing this is a man portable uh, anti-tank unit. And so we're seeing the Sarail Quds fighters set up the um, set up the missile um, before this launched. And this is the thing about Sorrel Kud's videos that we point out all the time is that they stick with the footage for longer. Um, and so we get to see some of the more details of these operations. Um, and so this is an anti-tank missile strike on a troop position. Um, so these are um, very effective weapons to be using against a troop position. 
Um, and it's interesting to see that footage because we haven't seen um, we haven't seen the Mailutka be used before. The Iranians call it the Rod uh, anti-tank missile. Um, and so we saw that used on October 7th, and we've seen it in field reports, but this is the first time um, we've seen it on film. And the mortar units, again, are constant. I don't bring the mortar unit shots uh, videos for the most part because we uh, there's so many other videos to show, uh, but these mortar rounds are constantly um, being used. And if we go to the next one here tomorrow, it's perfect timing there. Now we're seeing a Sarail Quds unit in a tunnel um, here, and they're saluting um, the Janine brigades as they're moving through a sh after the assassination that Nora reported on at the beginning of the show. Um, after the assassination in Janine, uh, these fighters are saluting those fighters in their tunnel position. And we see this is an elite unit of uh, Sarail Quds in the north. Um, they say, today Ramadan is upon us as part of the Battle of Al-Aqsa flood from here, from under the earth, from the tunnels of Sarai Al-Quds Northern Brigade elite unit. We send salutes to the axis of resistance led by the Yemenis and our people in Lebanon and the Janine brigades and all of the brigades fighting throughout the West Bank. May you be well. And then we see this unit move through the tunnel um, underground to come up into an um, an anti air defense uh, for to an air defense unit, and we're seeing them use a Dushka um, heavy machine gun targeting footage there, showing us a Heron drone, an Israeli um, drone, um, and so the tunnel is it's a tunnel borne operation. The tunnel feeds the fighters um, moving into this concealed position. Um, and using this heavy machine gun that we saw on October 7th be mounted on pickup trucks during the operation against Israeli bases. And see, we're, we're seeing it here, Bum Sarail Quds be used against an Israeli drone. Um, we've seen drones in pieces be um, um, in pieces. Um, and so that's partly uh, if using a weapon like this would destroy the drone. But we've also seen drones be um, hacked and landed, apparently um, landed safely without a scratch on them. Um, that's not what's going to happen if you hit that uh, drone with the 50 cal that we're seeing. So remarkable footage from Sarail Kuds showing us a tunnel base, um, showing us them immediately responding to actions in the West Bank, saluting their fighters, aware of the multi-front battle, shouting out the uh, Yemeni and Hezbollah resistance, um, which I've wanted to bring to people every time they do that, because that's an, um, an interesting part of the battle, the way that the fighters are communicating with each other um, on the battlefield. If we go to the next one, Tamara's. Um, this, is in, this is in Beit Hanun. So this is also in the north. This is a Qassam video in Beit Hanun. This is the first place that the Israelis invaded. This was the first place the Israelis said they had absolute... Uh, control over, which is just clearly a lie in November, and six months on, it's even more so. So here we're seeing a Qassam fighter um, hitting a D9 armored bulldozer with a um, with a Yassin in Beit Hanun, um, an area the Israelis said that they have controlled. So um, if we go to the next one here tomorrow, we can see <clears throat> this is a rocket unit um, because the rockets have continued. Uh, there was rocket attacks on um, Ashkelon the other day, and this is Sarai al Quds showing us them setting up this uh, rocket attack um, and leaving a note here. And that note says that at 9 p.m. tonight, these rockets will be fired. Um, and um, they're setting up these positions um, after all these months, after Israel having a military presence in the north, um, these rockets are being fired right from right under their nose. And and sure enough, at 9 p.m., um, Sarai al Quds fired on Ashkelon, and that's footage of that. So I wanted to uh, show you that resistance um, as well. The rockets are continuing. More than 13,000 rockets have been fired uh, through this war. So the battle at Shifa, the battle throughout the north, um, carrying on and um, I'm going to move on to the uh, West Bank now because Nora talked about the operation in the West Bank that was carried out on Friday by a single fighter, an unaffiliated fighter, Mujahid Mansour, 
um, who at midnight um, at midnight left his house um, and moved in the hills, moved through the hills around Ramallah um, and set up uh, overnight between midnight and 5 a.m., set up firing positions, sniper nests, um, set up rock embankments, um, and then at 5.15 in the morning, um, launched an operation against Israeli troops um, that Nora described. The, there was one killed, uh, an Israeli special forces soldier was killed, um, and seven others were wounded in this attack that lasted for five uh, hours. So the um, this is a fighter, Mujahid Mansour. He was a, uh, a veteran of the um, Palestinian Authority Presidential Guard, um, the security forces um, that are loyal to Mahmoud Abbas um, and were trained by Keith Dayton, the United States security um, coordinator who um, carried out the operation after the election of Hamas um, to eliminate Hamas from the West Bank. Um, and so this is a highly trained fighter, um, trained in the American um, training system, who retired more than a decade ago from the Palestinian uh, Authority Presidential Guard. He retired in 2013, um, um, so more than a decade ago. But he carried out this operation. We can show some of the footage of here. We have um, drone footage, uh, or actually, let's show the footage um, from the beginning of the operation with the sun rising here tomorrow. So this is this is Palestinian footage. With the audio in of the beginnings of the exchange of fire that happened just as the sun rose, um, the operation began. Um, and this operation carried on for five hours. The Israelis were unable to find, um, to get, uh, the Israelis called in their special forces unit, um, their Dov Devan um, unit, their um, Mr. Ravim, the soldiers who dress up as, um, as Arabs. They're rightly called a death squad. They're the uh, special forces, the Israelis call them elite special forces who kick in doors in the middle of the night and arrest people um, and arrest children. Um, but they are the uh, among the most highly trained Israeli forces, unable to get eyes, as they said, according to army radio, unable to get eyes on him. Their fighter, the Israeli soldiers were unable to get eyes on uh, Mujahid Mansour for five hours as he moved through the hills of Ramallah. Um, we can show the next one tomorrow. Sorry, I'm, I've lost my numbers. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this is footage that you can see from Israeli drone footage, and we're looking at um, the thickets of woods and olive trees and rocks and stones on the terraced hillsides um, around Ramallah. Um, and you can just see right in the middle of the screen there, you can just barely see him. There he moves between positions there. Um, so the Israelis had to call in multiple drones um, that we're looking at here. We're looking at drone footage of him moving between positions that he had pre-prepared um, and all the while is firing on Israeli troops. Um, one killed, seven wounded, two seriously wounded, um, including the battalion commander who reported um, on this. Um, and so we can see him moving around through these positions. If we go to the next one tomorrow, we can see um, we can see the way that he is using um, the landscape around these hills, around um, the West Bank, around Ramallah, um, these terraced hillsides to um, evade Israeli troops. Um, we're seeing drone footage here of him moving um, through the area. And in the next footage, um, we can see him targeting this drone. So if we watch, um, he actually downs two drones. Um, the Israelis, let me just give you some numbers from the Israeli reporting. This is from Army Radio. Um, they said, the Israelis said, we fired three suicide drones at him. So these are exploding drones that effectively act as missiles. Um, we, they missed him with three, and the um, Israeli Special Forces Unit dropped 12 grenades um, on him, and he was able to evade all of those. Um, he killed the Israeli Special Forces soldier um, from 20 meters away without moving. So even when they hit the soldier, if we watch him, he's in the middle of the screen here, and you're going to watch him. You're going to notice him look up and see the drone. Um, 
right here. He looks up, sees the drone, aims his rifle, and fires the drone uh, out of the air. And if we go to the next one tomorrow, we can see him do it again. Um, skilled marksmanship here, um, defeating these drones that are coming, that are attacking him, suicide drones that are attacking him, surveillance drones that are following him, um, and he's neutralizing these um, attacks. So this is a lone wolf attack. He's not affiliated with any of the armed movements, um, but this is the kind of resistance there. He's downing the drone. Um, we're seeing footage of the drone um, being knocked out of the sky and landing on the ground. Um, it's just a really remarkable operation that began at 5.15 in the morning um, and carried on for five hours before the Israelis um, strafed him with an Apache helicopter using two Apache helicopters, um, a special forces unit, um, and unable for five hours to, um, to, he was able to, Mujahid Mansour was able to hold the army off for five hours in a remarkable operation that maybe we can talk about with Abdel Jawad when he comes on, because it was reminiscent of an attack in the West Bank in 2002, um, a sniper attack that was one of the more famous attacks of the Second Intifada, where a single sniper, um, Mujahid was using a World War I Springfield rifle to carry out the operation on Friday. Um, and in 2002, in the Second Intifada, it was a Second World War rifle um, that was carried out during the Wadi al Haramia um, operation, where um, the Palestinian fighter in 2002 um, killed uh, 10 seven Israeli soldiers killed 10 uh, fighting aged males, seven Israeli soldiers injured six others, 16 shots out of 24 shots that he took hit before his gun backfired. Um, and he was able to escape and the, pal the Israelis were unable to find uh, Tahir Ahmed who carried out the 2002 operation for many years afterwards. So it's one of the more successful operations, legendary operations of the second intifada. So, um, that Mujahid Mansour operation, um, a remarkable one, because with Abdul Jawad here, we're going to talk about resistance throughout the West Bank and the organized resistance. We watched the organized resistance in the Gaza Strip, um, but there's also lone wolf attacks um, that the Palestinians carry out. And that one was one of the more successful ones um, that we've seen. So that is the resistance report. Now maybe we can... Um, I'm looking forward to bringing on uh, Abdul Jawad to be able to have a discussion. With. It's been a while since we've seen him, and uh, I'm excited to chat. Yeah, same. Thank you, John, uh, for that exhaustive, meticulously curated. A lot happened this week. A lot. It was a big week, a big week um, in so many ways. So thank you for that, um, putting that together, and especially to see what's happening in the West Bank is is important because, um, as you keep saying, in any other time, uh, what is happening in the West Bank would be labeled an intifada. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so thanks for that. And uh, Ali, let's bring on Abdul Jawad. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. But it's been way too long. Many apologies for not having you on a lot sooner, um, but uh, I we, just missed uh, you. <laughs> good. We missed you. Thanks so much for being here. I have it. and and thank you, John, for that uh, as usual extraordinary uh, update. Now I'll just say what's striking to me um, among so many things is how um, relentless it is. Like after six months, they are keeping up the pace, and uh, I know that provides. Um, I want to choose my words carefully. A lot of people note that the resistance continues. They take note of that. Yeah, there's no question about that. And to see the second that the Israelis enter these areas, they're resisted immediately. And like I said, Zaytun um, was a fierce battle before this. Um, and so the, the, it's, there's no indication of any kind of degrading of these forces um, and their ability to fight and the resistance is um, courageous and effective yeah uh and asa hi hi asa thanks for coming on as well um abud let's let's start with you um do you want to comment on on the report that john just showed us uh, especially the attack um that happened uh, close to where you live and work 
in the West Bank? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, John did a great job outlining um, the heroics involved um, with Mujahid's operation and also pointing out some of the paradoxes of having people who were trained through, uh, you know, what was supposed to be a counterinsurgent force uh, faced by the Americans uh, after the Second Intifada, now becoming resistance fighters that can uh, pull off an attack that was, uh, as John said, also reminiscent of uh, another attack in 2012, Ayun al-Haramiyya or uh, Wad al-Haramiyya attack. I think what is important here is also the extent of which we see a type of post-heroic Israeli form of warfare um, at display. And for me, uh, throughout the six months, um, Israel in the past used to be able to us with its operations, its intelligence, its uh, meticulous uh, planning, its ability uh, to assassinate, its ability to reach targets. And I think one of the factors that we have seen uh, transpire beginning from the October 7th until today is that um, the Palestinians as a fighting force have been able uh, to create this awe effect um, rather than the Israelis. The Israelis have lost um, any ability to capture the imagination of people through uh, the organization of violence. This is happening whether it's in the West Bank or in Gaza. We've seen uh, all around, and actually Israel built its reputation on military prowess. It built its reputation largely on its ability to be daring, to be innovative, creative, uh, to show uh, heroics of uh, the new uh, Israeli hero uh, who stands in the face of danger and can pull off tricks. Um, and I think that's been lost. I mean, um, what we've seen from Israel is just uh, monstrosity, uh, its ability to shock without uh, awe, uh, awe people or without you know, creating that kind of uh, effect. And that's happening also in West Bank in, in terms of you know, for the past six months, you had an intense campaign of derailment of the Palestinian resistance that, you know, was uh, coalescing around these kind of dense urban spaces that we've talked about a lot before, uh, refugee camps in the north of the West Bank. But for six months, this uh, nascent, uh, you know, uh, 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 semi-organized uh, resistance has been able uh, to still uh, persist, to maintain the capacity to resist, to reformulate its uh, tactics, um, and it's still uh, capable of producing IEDs, uh, engaging in clashes, and in also conducting offensive actions that we've also covered in the past episodes. And and, and I don't want to go back and, and do that. And and one of the latest, um, you know, attacks was the one in in the Ramallah area, um, which has also a particular, you know, um, let's say it's true, it's it's a lone wolf attack. Uh, most likely um, using this kind of old rifle. So that also indicates, uh, you know, no real organizational links, etc. But it shows this kind of uh, will uh, part of also Palestinians in the West Bank to participate in whatever uh, form or manner uh, possible for them uh, throughout uh, this uh, war. And this is just one example of it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's my take uh, thus far. And I think, um, you know, um, uh, when you talked, John, about Ta'ir and his operation, um, and, you know, um, in 2012, uh, two, I'm sorry, when his operation was uh, conducted um, with the amount of soldiers and exact hits, because I think he had 26 people hit by his rifle, um, you know, people thought that he's a well-trained sniper. Uh, and in many, and, and we discovered later on when he was arrested, that Ta'er had only uh, grew, grew up in Silwad, which is a village near Ramallah as well, uh, knows the geography very well around uh, Silwad, used also similar to, to Mujahid's operation, positioned himself well, it's an area, actually, the, the meaning of Ayun al haramiyah means the eyes of thieves. Historically, it used to be a place from which thieves would launch uh, uh, attacks on caravans moving from Jerusalem towards Damascus uh, because it's a low area. 
And in that operation, um, um, he hearkened back to his skills that he developed as a young child watching his grandfather hunting. And it also tells us something about the Palestinian resistance and his experience. In many instances, even if you don't have training or these complex military formations uh, that we see in the Gaza Strip, or you know, um, across the region in the form of Hezbollah, etc., that the form of embodied knowledge of people's daily experiences, their own memory of them well when they conduct such operations. And in the case of Mujahid, this combination of him being uh, trained as a presidential guard member, and at the same time knowing the geography of his own village very well, and using those two combinations was was. Uh, pivotal in his ability uh, to conduct a successful operation where eight uh, Israeli soldiers were uh, hit, one uh, eventually died. Yeah. It must be, uh, Aboud, thank you for that. I mean, it, it must be really terrifying now to Israel and the Palestinian Authority. They've always had this kind of um, fear that... Um, members of the so-called security forces who are trained under American and European um, auspices and with with their funding could turn against uh, Israel. And that happened in 1996. Uh, you, I think I'm the, probably the only one here who remembers that. Uh, I don't know, maybe others do. But, uh, you know, in 1996, during the so-called tunnels incident, uh, when Netanyahu, who was prime minister for the first time, opened this tunnel under Al-Aqsa, which was part of the take, you know, the effort to take over it, to take over Jerusalem, take over Al-Aqsa, and it sparked um, battles across the West Bank, and um, very fierce armed engagements between Palestinian Authority forces and. Um, the uh, Israeli enemy and the Palestinian forces actually liberated certain areas. They liberated Joseph's tomb in uh, occupied Nablus uh, and um, the, the Israeli soldiers there had to surrender or be rescued. And then uh, Yasser Arafat actually handed back the liberated areas to the occupier, which is something I never understood. You liberated them. Why did you give them back? But since then, uh, the how, how do they handle that fear or tension? I mean, you need these security forces, if you're the Palestinian Authority in Israel, to repress and torture uh, Palestinians and to hand them over to Israel. But at the same time, they have guns and they have families and they have feelings and they're part of the Palestinian people. H how do they manage that tension? I mean, it's it's a specter, I think, that haunts, uh, first of all, the, the political class in the West Bank that, that runs these organizations, but also uh, the Israelis. And you've rightly pointed this out. Um, I think that, in essence, um, what we even have seen in the north of the West Bank is an indication of the slow erosion of the relation ties, uh, the Fatih base, if you want, uh, coming from different social classes and this political class um, embodied in, in, in the president, the current president and security heads and some of the financial interests that exist in the West Bank. So this is a long-term trend. We've seen this kind of unbinding. And I think um, Islamic Jihad has pounced on this opportunity uh, uh, by building its base in the West Bank. And the Islamic Jihad is significant here because unlike, for instance, Hamas, which has this kind of internal rivalry with Fatah, uh, in fact, uh, Islamic Jihad, uh, a lot of them historically came from the Fatah base itself and have the capacity to easily navigate within uh, the, the Fatah social base, base in Tulkarim and Nabla and Junin and other areas. So we have seen a lot of the fighters in the North of the West Bank coming either from security services themselves or their families are security service members. So this is not necessarily only Mujahid and his case in their Bzir and what we've seen in terms of the operation, 
this is a larger trend that tells you that the ideological power through which the PA and its political class maintains control over its own base has been eroding. However, having said that, that does not mean that there's not sort of a stratification between um, certain members of the uh, security system, uh, the leaders, the, the geo class that, you know, uh, handles the security services, and also, you know, the rise of, let's say, a current within Fatah that says that we're losing this historical moment. Um, you know, the, 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 the train of history is passing us by. Uh, we're not being engaged in any sense. Um, and that the current leadership is leading, you know, the Fatah movement towards uh, disaster. There are these voices. They remain unorganized. They remain outside of any kind of real power within the movement itself. And I think there's an intricate uh, um, uh, policing of these security ser services that is done constantly by its backers, meaning that when they see or notice or even smell that one of the members of these security services is slightly coming back to his senses in terms of uh, you know, that a new direction should be uh, taken. Uh, we see, you know, uh, the political class taking the decision of removing him from his post or sidelining him or retiring him or or, or other forms of, of, of ways to, to sustain a, a security force that does not have a political uh, posture as an organization. However, as individual members, um, these things can uh, completely go uh, against, uh, um, you know, any form of, you know, if people are betting or, or wagering that most of the security services would not fight uh, against Israelis, that they, I think that would be uh, uh, the wrong conclusion to take. Most of them would fight. The problem would be that they will, how, how would they fight as an organized force or would they fight more as, uh, you know, small cells out of their own, and at this moment, all we can say is that it's out of their own volition. Not nothing, nothing like uh, an organized uh, element exists, at least for the moment. Abdul Jawad, can you talk a little bit specifically about the significance of what's happening in and around Janine? Um, we see the Janine Brigade's uh, uh, members, affiliates being assassinated by Israeli drone strikes. Um, and then as Tamara reported, there were um, like clashes between um, people in Jenin and the Palestinian Authority Security Services during the funeral processions. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about how this is all playing out uh, specifically in Jenin? I mean, in Janine, what, what has played out in the past couple of months and intensified since was that, um, you know, Israelis have taken a more offensive approach, repetitive, attempting to basically um, break down the resistance uh, that has developed in the past two years or so in, in the new However, what we can say uh, is that despite the fact that now we can't talk about, you know, self-defense zones, um, areas where from which the resistance operates uh, and remains almost fixed, uh, the resistance has been more dispersed, mobile, um, has been attempting tactics of evasion, but at the same time been uh, running more offensive actions. We have seen some of it around uh, the settlement, the illegal settlement of Homish, which is near Janin, and and also the return of uh, repeated uh, gunfire attacks uh, on Jalame and other areas. Uh, now, the Israeli policy of this offensive uh, maneuvers within, deep within uh, Jenin, is also uh, using more air power, including the use of F-16s, for example, in, in, in one of the incidents, I think, in Nablus, the use of, of drones. Uh, which is also harkens back to this form of post heroic warfare of not necessarily engaging head on uh, with Palestinians, but uh, you know, being a, a form of killing where you don't expose yourself to the risk of being killed. Uh, something that we have seen, you know, play out in Gaza and also playing out in the West Bank. 
Um, at the same time, the Palestinian Authority has been using this kind of vacuum, this offensive by the Israeli military to arrest some of the members, uh, to also fight the ideological symbolic fight uh, within the Palestinian society in Jenin. Um, and it revolves around uh, the infrastructure that Israel has destroyed in the Jenin refugee camp, including the roads and the water and the electricity. I mean, uh, just to give you a sense, you know, Tul Karim, uh, Nur Shams camp and Jenin refugee camp, um, a lot of the civic infrastructure has been actually totally uh, uh, eroded uh, by Israeli bulldozers and D9. And there's, of course, this kind of ideological fight where, you know, the, the PA would use rumors, the Palestinian Authority would use rumors, would use, uh, you know, this notion that resistance does not is not effective and cannot and should and is highly costly and people should turn away from it. It's part of this pressure or lever of pressure that we have seen increasing by uh, PA or Palestinian Authority mouthpieces and people who represent their interest in Janine, in Gaza, and other places of the inefficacy of resistance and therefore uh, uh, convincing the civilian population or the Palestinians at large to place pressure on resistance fighters and groups to uh, seize the resistance, surrender, or hand uh, themselves or turn themselves in. And along with that, the PA has been trying to engage in, 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 in provocative fashion in arrest of key members within these groups. So there's a lot of, you know, built up anger uh, towards the Palestinian Authority. And um, it's not new that clashes would erupt or that uh, the resistance fighters would uh, shoot at Al Muqata'a in Jenin. This has been happening for years now. Um, uh, it's almost like uh, a hobby um, uh, uh, for the resistance fighters. And it's also an indication that they refuse and reject the form of policies that the PA represents and the security forces, um, you know, working alongside the Israelis to quell the capacity of the Palestinians to resist in the West Bank. Thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, I mean, what what can we say about this time when the resistance in Gaza um, is working to defend Gaza from the enemy occupier and the the genocidal acts um, as a, at the same time um, you know the resistance is re-emerging as as you've said uh, across the West Bank what does this say about kind of the general um, atmosphere in in Palestine um, where, you know, things are coming to a head um, where, you know, like uh, there are land grabs that are being resisted. There are settlement expansions that are being resisted. There is, um, you know, very open genocidal intent by the Israeli ministers. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Ben Gavir just, you know, deputizing the settler communities. Um, uh, so, what does this say about where the Palestine, uh, you know, liberation struggle is at at this time um, when we see what's happening across Palestine? And what are we not seeing uh, happening inside 48, inside, uh, you know, what's considered to be Israel? Uh, do you want the good news or the bad news first? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good news first. <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh... It's, it's always hard to like give uh, a sense of uh, where things stand. I mean, because there's like historical material or flows and, you know, that operate to produce this moment. And I think like any other people in the world, um, when you see this form of monstrosity in Gaza, of course, the first reaction is total fear, no? I mean, people are afraid and when they're afraid, um, they're paralyzed in, in many ways. So there's this kind of, you know, spectacle unfolding, but at the same time, that kind of fear that what happening in Gaza could easily happen in the West Bank, that the Palestinians in the Gaza are also uh, from the same, you know, cloth and blood and um, of the Palestinians in the West Bank. And there's nothing that really uh, would safeguard the Palestinians here from 
also a genocidal attempt. Actually, the West Bank is the prize for the Zionist movement and driving the Palestinians from the West Bank would be, you know, uh, uh, the most important, you know, element specifically for its fascist right wing, but also for the whole uh, Zionist movement as such. So um, I think people are coming to recognize this truth. However, there's always a difference between recognizing a truth theoretically and between letting it sink in. And uh, the West Bank and Jerusalem and Palestine 90, 1948, or the Palestinians within uh, or have citizenship of Israel, um, you know, have not accumulated power in the past 16 or 17 years since the Second Intifada. That's the thing that actually made Gaza distinct is that since the Second Intifada, there has been a constant accumulation of innovation, technologies, techniques, tactics, and of various including organizational power um, that enabled 7 October to happen, enabled this resistance to withstand the six-month genocidal uh, campaign uh, with, you know, you know the, the, tons of the tons of thousands of bombs being dropped on Gaza and still being able to resist um, through, you know, through meager means and under siege. I mean, that's, that, that has been the case in Gaza. There has been an accumulation of power in the West, that accumulation has not really truly uh, happened, at least in an organized fashion. And that's the case also for Jerusalem. That's the case also uh, for Palestinians in 48. So it, it leaves people in, I think, a sense of loneliness at this moment. And we talked about this, if you guys remember. I mean, I, I don't try to, like, you know, mince things or, or give people too much hope when there's, uh, you know, uh, little hope, but at the same time, you know, we talked about this in the sense that there's no social movement that can organize people. I mean, there's no social movement that can organize people can withstand. And there's a lot of reasons for that. People feel lonely. People feel like they're individuals. They're, you know, they live under this kind of totalitarian, authoritarian uh, regime, both, you know, the fascist totalitarian Israeli regime that treats Palestinians as subhuman without any rights and looks at them as, as people to be, uh, uh, you know, killed or ethnically cleansed or erased. And an authoritarian regime in, in the form of the Palestinian Authority uh, that sustains or that has built is its uh, entire, you know, edifice and language and political, the notion of killing the capacity of Palestinians to resist. That's what makes it relevant to centers of power in the US and Europe also for the Israelis. So within this, this formula, I mean, the Palestinians in the West Bank have to face this kind of dual, dual structure. And they've also been very creative. Even lone wolf attacks are a creative form of, you know, you know, moving beyond, you know, organization as such with leadership and cater and, you know, social movement, but at the same time still being effective and being able uh, uh, to hurt the Israeli settler infrastructure, being able to remind the Israelis that there's still creative agency among the Palestinians. But also now, at least in the north of the West Bank, there has been this rise of, of a more organized movement. So we've seen some signs, but again, um, at least in the West Bank, it remains a very and highly... Um, uh, not, a, not a collective moment where you know, uh, all regions of the West Banks are participating in. Um, I mean, we could say, and I agree with John when he says there's a, you know, you could call this an intifada, but I would say that it's an intifada in the north of the West Bank, just to, I wouldn't say it's in Hebron or in Bethlehem or in, in other areas. And, and I know this, this kind of distinction might not matter, but it matters because at least when you live in the West Bank, um, yes, there is an active revolt and insurgency in the north of the West Bank, which has been, you know, I think for me, I haven't anticipated the, the level of, of, of steadfastness that this resistance has showed. Uh, I thought after October 7th that with the pressure, because it's a new movement, that, you know, things will uh, become very dire. And because Israel has unleashed its, uh, you know, uh, power, it's not really worried about, you know, its international image. It will use more force that, you know, um, the resistance will not be able to withstand it. But despite 
after six months of an intensive campaign, uh, it's, you know, we've really um, some even signs of development and resistance in terms of IED capacities, in terms of what is being smuggled in, in terms of, uh, so not only has it been able to withstand despite the numerous assassination and arrests, but also even develop and innovate or at least create uh, more uh, maneuvering space and more power and accumulating it. So that's that that's been you know a, a highly uh, significant factor. As as for Palestine 48 or Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's a tough it's a tough place to have your everyday life being embroiled within already uh, um, you know within a state that is going into war. Um, you know, Palestinians in 48 work in, 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 in uh, the Israeli market. Uh, they have an intern everyday level with Israelis. Um, I think in many ways, uh, their feelings around this war, that their solidarity around this war exists. Uh, I think they also feel a sense of being paralyzed. Um, but in the past also 20 years or so, we've seen the national movement there dwindle in terms of its capacity to organize people and convince people we've seen the rise of you know armed um, gangs uh, in many of the arab communities within uh within israel we've seen um you know with kinds of uh of uh of violence being turned inwards rather than outward um and that does not mean just to to qualify that 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 could not turn in a spontaneous fashion um, against uh, the Israeli state, at the moment. but what it means is that again, there's very little form of organization to be able to meet the pressure that you need for this such a moment. And and when we're waiting for a spontaneous moment, a spontaneous spark comes from more from more an active uh, side. It comes from how people are, you know, reacting to the scenes they've seen. But you know, again. The monstrosity that have unfolded in Gaza have also managed, at least momentary, to cripple a lot of Palestinians out of fear. It, it's a it's a legitimate feeling to have, but that's what what that's that's what has been happening at least for now. Yeah, and Abud, I I I don't know if we can say it's a turning point, but when you talk about a moment or a spark or a spontaneous moment, if you just look over the last two days, the the, the massive protests in Jordan, um, and there have been constant protests in Jordan. They're not shown in the media, but they, they've sort of regained energy. And, and that's also in a context where the, the regime in Jordan is doing everything it can to allow what they would consider safe outlets for uh, people's emotions, but while maintaining a tight hold on any kind of anything that could develop into uh, practical support for the resistance for example they they prevent palestinians they pre prevent jordanians excuse me from um getting anywhere near the border you can be sure that the jordanian security forces are, are making sure to try to inter interdict any <coughs> weapons reaching the resistance and so on uh, and of course jordan as we've discussed and our colleague uh, Tamara ha, has written about uh, has uh, you know is helping to do kind of PR for the genocide by doing these airdrops of uh, of aid. But nonetheless, I, I just think it's it's notable that uh, the the popular sentiment is there, waiting to be active activated and and mobilized. And in the West Bank, you know. Uh, the fragmentation, the fact that people are, are, are physically separated from each other into all these different little enclaves and separated from Jerusalem um, has to play a part in that. But but nonetheless, I, 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 what I hear from you and I think is a, a semi-successful part of the Israeli strategy is the destruction of any or, or the attempt to destroy social organization. And in Gaza, for everything it's been, been through and the siege it's been under for so many years, 
people still had the ability. You still have mass organizations in Gaza in a way that uh, perhaps they're not allowed to operate in the West Bank. So the, those are, are notable differences. But nonetheless, nonetheless, when we look at the the big picture and the arc of history, so to speak, how long can this suppression work before uh, before the, the occupier's control is lost? I don't know the answer to that, but um, we've seen moments of it, like in May 2021, where it was really historic that uh, that you had simultaneous uprisings in the West Bank within 1948 areas, so-called Israel, and Gaza simultaneously. And this is something that Israel greatly fears, uh, but to some extent they've avoided this time. Of course, there's a risk in saying that because, as we've said repeatedly, the scale of what's happening in the West Bank only looks small relative to what's happening in Gaza. But in, in historic terms, the amount of resistance, especially as you point out to the north, is actually very um, high and people are paying a high price for it. And I think the steadfastness is there, the social steadfastness, the fact that people are um, not saying, you know, guys, let, let's just live a quiet life. There, there is support for, I, I think... There was a tweet the other day from Robert Satloff, who is uh, one of the you know very influential Israel lobbyists in the United States and a frequent visitor to some of the Arab tyrannies that uh, have normalized relationships with Israel. And he was lamenting a poll that came out uh, recently. I, I don't know how reliable these polls are, but in any case, the poll showed very high support for the resistance on October 7th uh, among Palestinians, including and especially in the West Bank. Uh, and so, again, I, I, I just point that out to say that the, the, potential, the potential is there. I mean, I agree with you, Ali. I, look, I think that, you know, we have seen, historically speaking, um, the flow of resistance being sometimes concentrated in Palestinian history in the Shatat or the diaspora, then coming back to be uh, with historic Palestine. There's always resistance everywhere. I mean, um, as you know, uh, Basil Araj, who's a martyr, uh, uh, was killed in, in 2017, would say there's not a single day that would go by without a resistant act. And he was right by by saying that, and and that includes in the West Bank. Every day, there's, you know, uh, hundreds, if not tens, of of resistance acts. Um, but what I wanted to just point out is that sometimes when you have this kind of organized movement in the Gaza Strip, and when you have the ability to face off with the Israeli military on military terms and ground, and in other places that is lacking. For a lot of reasons, also because, um, just to point out, that a lot of the civil disobedience uh, forms of operation within the West Bank are also not available for people. So if you demonstrate on friction points, you just as you're are, you're just a sitting duck, waiting to be killed without feeling your own efficacy. Uh, and you know you know tactics do not come up from just people sitting in a cave somewhere and thinking them. They come up from this kind of interaction with their concrete situation, with their everyday life, with what happened if you demonstrate, uh, do um, if you're just a sitting duck, maybe you should not be a sitting duck. So for a lot of Palestinians, at least when it comes to the West Bank, the West Bank suffers from spatial distance from its colonizers, like Gaza, without an organized movement that can supplant it and help it overcome that with the form of you know, offensive actions that we have seen taking place or with ballistics and, you know, weapon armaments and etc. Having said that, I mean, um, the other the other point I would uh, just mention is that sparks or spontaneous sparks are not something that could be easily predictable. Uh, I mean, we all thought the PLO leaving Lebanon 
ending up in Tunisia, um, being completely uh, exiled, uh, um, you know, without any borders between it and historic past, without the struggle, that would be a, like a, a low moment in the Palestinian struggle until in 1987, uh, the first Intifada uh, happened. So five years, six years later. Nobody can anticipate when a spontaneous spark, but the signs are there. Because whenever there is any form of resistance, it means that there is a will. It means that people have creative agency. It means they're thinking about their condition and attempting to break, uh, uh, um, break this condition, open new political possibilities. And it means at any moment, this form of parallel that we're seeing at least now, it's of course temporary. It's does not, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be lasting or it doesn't mean that it's gonna be uh, something of a permanent uh, one, especially since Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza live in the same horizon which is a horizon of erasure and being inhalated. And that is clear from what Israeli leaders are saying, from the settler movement that has now been armed with uh, hundreds of thousands of rivals in the West Bank, with the expansion of illegal settlement, the, the largest, biggest uh, take up of land since Oslo happened, I think yesterday or before yesterday, I think Tamara wrote an article on it. Uh, you know, so these things are moving. It's a moment where people feel a sense of fear, um, disorientation. However, I would never bet against uh, Palestinians' ability to generate resistance, not because I'm being here romantic or fetishizing it, but because I've read history quite a lot and I've seen how Palestinians have um, you know, again and again, been able to create these moments that nobody have anticipated. We've seen the last one in October 7th, but, you know, down the line in other locations and geographies, we'll see uh, something happen and transpire. Yeah, and, and look at the big picture. The Palestinian people have been fighting not just Israel or resisting, not resisting. You know, I, the word fighting suggests the Palestine, you know, Palestinians were minding their own business in their country when the world came to them. They didn't go to Ukraine and Poland and Russia to pick a fight with, with other people. But uh, the Palestinian people have been resisting for, you know, 75 plus years, not just Israel, but the world's biggest imperial power. Zionism was sponsored and was to a large extent, a creation of the British, and then briefly became sponsored by the French. That was a short interlude, because um, I think the Zionists could see that France was going down the drain, uh, just like Britain. And then it uh, latched onto the United States, which is cu its current sponsor. So now the Palestinians are resisting the United States, all of Europe, Germany, uh, uh, and other great powers and institutions, and yet they are undefeated. And that is what gives me hope, ultimately, that Palestine will be liberated. Because think of all the ways that these powers have, uh, have devised to try to defeat this people, to try to crush them, to try to make them lose hope, and they failed. And it's, it's also been policies not just of brutality and murder and killing but also bribery and that that was a big theme of the you know of so-called economic peace from the period of uh, Salam Fayyad and Tony Blair when he was the representative of the so-called quartet where it was very explicit in their discourse and their documentation that we're going to turn Palestinians into consumers uh, we're going to give them mortgages we're going to give them credit cards and there was, in fact, a huge explosion of consumer credit in the West Bank. People, you know, encouraging people to go into debt with the idea that they will uh, become so concerned about paying off their debts that they won't want to engage in any kind of politics or resistance. And none of that, yes, of course, you can point to individuals or certain segments of society that have been bought off in every anti-colonial struggle that happens. But as a people, as a nation, the cause, and, and as a global cause, the cause of Palestine is only gaining strength. And that would be encouraging. And, it's, you know, that, that would be a cause for celebration were it not also in the context of this ongoing 
genocide. But, you know, I, I just always take heart from what you say, Abud, that the potential is there. And I believe the result will be... Uh, it, it, to me, it's inconceivable that this Zionist project can survive. But none of us can say... And I, I'm thinking back now to our discussion with Ilan Pape last week that this colonial project is coming to an end. But every colonial project, the end is horrifying and bloody and terrible um, because these these colonizers don't go quietly. I mean, they will not take the hint. And they also can't learn the lessons of history, that uh, phrase that, that, uh, that the, uh, we hear from time to time. Col- the, the, the leave quietly, let people go, let them have their liberation because they're going to take it from you in the end anyway. I mean, yeah, I mean, the arrogance, yeah? Nora, please. No, go ahead. No, I mean, I'm, I, I didn't want to say anything. I just, <laughs> I think Ali, Ali for me encapsulated the, the arrogance that also was you know their, uh, you know, their tragic fall in, in on October seventh, underestimating the people that you fight. No. Yeah, and it's completely, um, it's shattered their, you know, their their psychology. I mean, you know, Israel was was sold to them as settlers, as this, you know, safe, impenetrable you know, um, the highest military, you know, force and, and, uh, and it was, it was shaken by guerrilla fighters who haven't given up. Um, it's yeah. Uh, anyway, we are, um, about out of time, uh, with you, Abdul Jawad, Omar. Um, finally, like, I don't know. I, how how do you see this? You know, now six months. Um, what are the what are the things that you're watching carefully in the West Bank um, from where you are, and um, and and what what is what is kind of standing out significantly to you when you see what's happening in Gaza? I mean, I think for me, when when I look um, at Gaza, and I think I'll I'll, I'll be honest here, I think. Um, when the war started, uh, I did not anticipate the extent that it will be stretched uh, in time. Um, so that kind of shifted my whole thinking around January, uh, around the nature of this war and where it could lead. Because I think until today, we can see no end in sight. We can see Israel trying to buy more time. Uh, we can see uh, use of uh, hunger. Um, it's continuation of bombing, it's a uh, post heroic form of warfare and monstrosity playing out in Gaza. And at the same time, um, you know, it has left the resistance in Gaza also with a condition where there's nothing much to lose in terms of what, you know, the resistance was deterred from before the destruction of Gaza. Um, you know, the worst has already kind of happened which means that, you know, um, uh, Israel's calculus that, you know, Palestinians would give up easily is not going to happen at any point. So I see this continuing at least for some time. Maybe some sort of ceasefire will will, will emerge, uh, but uh, I wouldn't really bet uh, on it, at least at this uh, particular moment. When it comes to the West Bank, I think, to me, uh, my eyes have always in the past couple of years turned towards Jerusalem as a marker and a sign of of the the spark or the moment a spontaneous uh thing would emerge um because that's the place where palestinians have direct interaction with their colonizers it's also the place where the pa does not exist and it's also the place that holds a significant religious symbolic and political uh, uh, importance to the Palestinian people across historical Palestine. So, I mean, uh, as Ramadan has unfolded in Jerusalem, we have seen, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, people going and praying in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, 
tensions have not really uh, spiraled in a way that would indicate anything happening uh, anytime soon. But I, you know, I still think that, that um, the breeze that is coming from Jordan, uh, the breeze that is coming slightly from uh, uh, Egypt in terms of mass demonstrations, this feeling that something needs to happen and the, pe the people need to take more of an active stance, it's starting uh, uh, to move, perhaps slowly. Uh, but that's what I'm looking at uh, at this particular moment. Also, the ability of Palestinian resistance to uh, withstand and develop itself and, um, you know, engage in uh, tiresome uh, uh, or tiresome in, in, in the sense that taking costs out of the occupation uh, operations in the West Bank, which have been more intense more repeated and more uh, also sophisticated, at least in the past couple of months. And I think this trend will just uh, increase as the as as we move on. Thank you. It's always uh, such a pleasure to have you on, Abdul Jawad Omar. You're a lecturer in uh, at Birzeit University in the occupied West Bank. You were uh, also a writer and. Um, and you're like now a very frequent guest on many podcasts, um, including this one, but also Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, uh, many others. So um, it's always great to have you back on. Thank you. And we had a, a wonderful uh, long form interview with you um, with uh, Tamara Nassar uh, a couple of months ago, but it remains extremely uh, valuable yeah. uh, in terms of just providing broad context. So for people who haven't had enough of uh, uh, Abud today, I would strongly recommend that you'll find it on the YouTube channel. And of course, uh, we uh, we have missed you. So we do need to have you yeah. back, uh, back more. Yeah. I miss you too, guys. <laughs> but it's great that your voice is getting out there. And I have watched some of your interviews and, and you provide... Uh, such uh, deep uh, insights and context, and we're, we're very grateful for it. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Ali. So I've been also watching you guys all the time, and uh, <laughs> the work the work you have been doing has been uh, more than outstanding. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we'll have you back on very soon. Thanks so much, Abud. Thanks. And um, let's see. Before we wrap, we wanted to uh, shout out some of our audience members for today <clears throat> yeah um okay solidarity from stockholm sweden hi from switzerland suffolk uk pakistan arizona germany basque country toronto lisbon portugal thank you everybody from yeah and and let let me just say that uh, you know it's it's so nice to see the messages on uh, on the comments while we're doing the live stream. But we also get really so many wonderful messages from uh, so many people around the world. And people say to us all the time, you know, you help me get through this. You help me to cope with just the horror. Because, I mean, how, how does any of us know how to cope with genocide? And I, I want to say that it goes both ways. Six months mm. into this, for us to be here each week, every day doing this work, we couldn't do that without the strength and support you give us. We really, we're a, we're a community and we're a growing community. And I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone for all that love and support you give us. It helps us to do this work and um, it, keeps us, it keeps us coming back every day. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay. Any more comments? Um, kudos to Mr. John Elmar. I love his analysis, says Daniel Day. Thank you. Uh, regular viewer Tanweer says, good to see Abdul Jawad Omar back on EI to share his insights. Um, and Big Teal says, Glad for your sober analysis of boot. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. 
Yeah, thank you, everybody. And um, before we go, we also uh, have a number of extraordinary features on the homepage right now at electronicintifada.net that I wanted to um, to put out there as well. Um, so let's see, let's look at some of them. Um, I know that uh, one of our writers, Abu Bakr Abed, who we had on the live stream a few weeks ago, um, has a, a just extraordinary new story um, right there on the front page, a Ramadan of heartbreak. Um, really incredible. And again, you know, he's one of uh, many writers that we have in Gaza uh, who are sending us their reports and dispatches, um, sometimes over WhatsApp, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, um, and, and and just yeah. look, you know, all these features uh, here on the front, most of them that yeah. you see right there, Abu Bakr, as you mentioned, but Khaled Al Hissi and Khaled Al Rashelli, Yusuf Al Halak, Rakan Abed, Ruwaida Amir. These are writers who are in Gaza um, or, fr or from Gaza. Most of them are actually in Gaza right now. And uh, we had a, a lovely note from a, um, a friend in Canada recently asking us could. could could they print out our articles and hand them out at a, a protest or a rally? Uh, guys, you don't need our permission. <laughs> print Please. away. <laughs> print away, share away, forward away. We want their voices to be out, and that's why we're doing this work, and we are so grateful. Um, the, the best way you can support us is to share the work to let the world know um, the conditions that our colleagues in Gaza are working under are just indescribably horrifying, and and yet they're doing it because they want the world to know what what they're going through. And by the way, there's a uh, right on the, the the front panel. There is Asa's piece on that. That's a picture of Yossi Landau of the um, Jewish extremist group Zaka that was responsible for so many of the October 7th lies and who was uh, interviewed all over the world and who accompanied, by the way, Pramila Patton, the uh, UN um, official who uh, who did this so-called report on sexual violence. Yossi Landa was with her when she toured some of the kibbutzes in southern Israel. So that's a really important piece. And if we just scroll down, Tamara, to look at some of the posts on the right-hand side of the page, um, you can see there that uh, Tamara has this great piece on Nas Daily, uh, um, yes, uh, Nasser Yassin, who's this, you know, uh, some of you won't have heard of him, but many of you will. He's this viral video maker. He's a Palestinian, I don't know, let's just be frank, he's a Palestinian Zionist. And there are a few of them, unfortunately. Um, and uh, But he... he uh, recently took an award from the Anti-Defamation League, a pro-genocide organization. So I, I think it's so important to hold uh, public figures like this accountable. And so I, I really love this piece. And some of the others, Tamara, um, that we have up right now include, um, well, several from from the very prolific Tamara, <laughs> Nasar, which is amazing. There's Nora's piece with background on the Security Council vote, which, uh, Nora, you mentioned in the opening, but is... Oh, is that's so Maureen's piece. Maureen's piece, yeah. but I mean, you mentioned it, oh, uh, yeah. you quoted from it, but yeah. I can't recommend it enough just in terms of the analysis. And yeah. if we go back again, Tamara, I also want to point out Nora's interview, uh, a standalone interview with um, with Daryl Lee about uh, how weapon uh, terrorism laws are being used against uh, Palestinians. So as you can see, there is so much uh, amazing material produced uh, by our colleagues. Um, and um, we do it all with, with your support. So it's a chance to say thank you to those who have made uh, and continue to make donations because that that's how we do this work that's how we stay independent and don't forget uh, of course nora will tell you but i'm uh, 
I'm, I'll say it too. Don't forget to sign up for the email list that get updates button at the top left hand side of the page. That's right. So yes, please sign up for our email list. Um, that guarantees that we still have a connection to you, even if the uh, powers that be decide to, you know, um, stick a wrench in our our YouTube uh, um, uploads, which uh, sometimes they try to do. Um, and uh, it's it's really the best way to learn about what we've been publishing. You get just one daily email uh, with a digest of all the, the recent stories that we've published, as well as um, notifications for our upcoming live streams. So uh, please do sign up for our email list and go to our YouTube page. You can subscribe. And that'll also notify you of upcoming live streams and new podcast standalone episodes. I think I think that's it. Um, as always, our extraordinary director and producer Tamara Nassar behind the scenes, and um, and uh, yeah, just uh, another extraordinary day. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thanks, John, Asa, and Ali. And uh, on behalf of all of us at the Electronic Intifada, thank you all for watching and listening. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you.